Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's 8.30, Wednesday morning, and I'm very happy that I'm not alone here and that we are all made it for this birthday party. Well, more or less 50 years ago, it was on, I had to write it down, is it correct? On March 23, 1968, the research vessel Glomer Challenger was launched in Texas, United States of America. Only a few months later, the first deep sea drilling leg into the Gulf of Mexico started this absolutely wonderful research project, this international research project lasting until today. Leg one, by the way, I checked once more, there were just eight scientists on board. And chief scientist was Maurice Ewing, but I was very happy to see, for instance, Al Fisher was the sedimentologist on board, and Bill Burkren as a paleontologist, and then a small group of people, some others. Uh, that's the way this story of success started. We decided to have this union symposium because it's a special event, and the conveners of the symposium are Juliana Panieri, Gilbert Gamma, and myself, and we will move around up here on stage. Well, who can start such a birthday party? Everybody knows there's only one person, and it's Judy McKenzie. Well, Judy, she has been associated with the ocean and deep sea drilling program since many, many, many years. And her first campaign with the, at that time with Glomer Challenger and the deep sea drilling pro program brought her into the North Pacific. Topic was uh, Emperor, uh, Hawaiian Emperor Hotspot Experiment. The next one was a paleoceanography lake. She went on 1980 from Santos to Cape Town. I remember this very well because I was on, a sedimentologist on that lake. And we were at that time for the first time using piston coring for a whole ocean transect or half of the ocean transect uh, in the South Atlantic. Well, Judy continued with, of course, things which are well known to us. She went into the Medi Mediterranean and that was uh, a lake already with uh, Joy Des Resolution in the mid 80s uh, into the Mediterranean. These Mediterranean lakes, of course, got extremely famous. And of course, Judy was became also famous for her Mediterranean work. Then later on, we shouldn't forget, she was chief scientist on the lake into the northeastern Australian region of Great Barrier Reef, and then she was also on the Bahamas Lake, Tra Bahamas Transect Lake, and she served on so many important commissions, review committees, and she brought with her activities ocean drilling forward also, and she, she was one of the key persons bringing the ocean drilling program to the point where we are now today. So with her 40 years of experience, Judy, I think let's start with Oh, the title, The Odyssey of Ocean Research Drilling, Past and Future Directions. Judy, stage is yours. So, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Helmi. I promise not to tell any stories. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm very pleased to have been asked to give this introductory talk for this session. And when I chose the title, Odyssey of Ocean Research Drilling, and the reason is, um, at Christmas time, when I was thinking of what to do for this talk, a friend of mine, his son, is doing a PhD in classics, can you imagine? And his thesis is on the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey. And we were talking about the Odyssey, and it just came to me that, you know, the Odyssey is a tale of adventure and discovery. I don't want you to read this, this is not, you can look at it as you go along, but he, the, the young colleague, his, he told me, but the Odyssey was only 10 years and you have to talk about 50 years. And I thought, how can I talk about 50 years? It's just too much. So I decided to take the example of the Odyssey and concentrate on the discovery, the tales of adventure and discovery of the first 10 years. 
And this will then be the, 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 the focus of my talk. Now, my odyssey of ocean discovery begins in the uh, 1970 and 73. Before I ever joined the ship, I was a PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And this was an incredibly exciting time. I had studied chemistry. I was not a geologist. I had gone there to learn something about marine geology. And I had no idea about non-plate tectonics. For me, I learned plate tectonics from the beginning of my education. And this is something that uh, we heard a lot about last year uh, because it was the 50th anniversary of the plate tectonics uh, breakthroughs in, in the so-called revolution. And uh, these people who you see the names here, um, wait, okay. Uh, 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 Tusa Wilson, Dan McKenzie, and Jason Morgan were all instrumental. And we had a lot of talks about this at AGU and uh, in London and at different universities last year. So I'm not going to emphasize that too much, but also at Scripps, at the same time, was the ocean drilling program was housed there. And you can't imagine, I wasn't on the ship, but all of my professors were involved. All of my teachers had access to the data and were talking about what was being discovered. And secondly, um, many, many people had, to, like what we know, everybody has to go to College Station now or to Kochi. Everybody was passing through La Jolla. So I got to meet a lot of very fascinating people. And within the first, well, Helmi mentioned leg one, but it was actually leg three, three when they actually were able to say they tested the hypothesis of seafloor spreading related to plate tectonics, and they came away saying, yes, indeed. And after that, everybody was great believers. Now, this is the reason the whole program was started, was to test this hypothesis. And um, there's a very nice paper from uh, Roger Ravel where he wrote, through ocean drilling campaigns, using the facilities of the Glomar Challenger, this kind of looks like an old rust bucket now, doesn't it? <laughs> Sediment and rock samples were recovered from beneath the seafloor to provide the direct proof of the hypothesis, and in fact, the primary goal was amazingly achieved within the first 10 years of ocean drilling. Now, my odyssey of ocean discovery, as Helmi mentions, begins in 1977 when I was invited. In 1977, I was now a postdoc at, in, at the ATA in Zurich, and Ken Shu sent me a message. I was doing some field work somewhere and said, you must go now to California. Got to California, no, you must go to Hawaii. And I joined the ship in Hawaii for this absolutely fantastic um, a deep uh, ocean, deep sea drilling leg to study the, the, the hotspot. And this was really an experiment. And as all of you know, whenever you're on the ship, the, the tradition is that you do a group photograph. And this is the group photograph from the, the leg, leg 55. And um, it's, it's really a teamwork. Anyone who's ever participated knows this. Not only is it teamwork, you're working 12 hours a day seven days a week, night and day, and, and you're just discussing science. And in these days, back in our days, there was no internet. There was no connection with the outside world. And you can imagine, if you're all the way in the Northwest Pacific, you're very far away from civilization. And our team, actually, you can't see him here, so I'm going to do a little blow up, included Jason Morgan. So it was absolutely great fun to have this guy who developed this hypothesis with us out there testing it in, in the deep sea environment. Well, we also had a team that included a sea lion. And as I mentioned, we were really isolated. And this sea lion was way far away from home. And he joined us on the ship. And he stayed with us the whole time. So we were happy. The crew was happy to feed him. And it was like another member of the scientific party. Now, the sea lion wasn't the only one who was accompanying us at this time. We also had a Soviet naval vessel. He was, was with us the whole, whole cruise. And um, uh, when you think about this, what was it? Why was there a naval vessel with us? Well, these are the Cold War days. Maybe we're still back in the Cold War days, but this naval vessel was following us because the sister ship of the Glomar Challenger 
was the Glomar Explorer, which was specifically built to pick up a Russian submarine up in the same area where we were doing the drilling. So this Russian uh, vessel stayed with us watching, never had communication, even though we had a Russian scientist on board, they never communicated with us. And we were not so successful in the beginning. In fact, um, we were two sedimentologists, Anne-Marie Karpov at the University of Strasbourg, she's a clay mineralogist, I was a geochemist, and we were looking at sediments. And I think they invited us because they needed to have sedimentologists, but the whole rest of the scientific crew were petrologists. Well, the petrologists weren't getting anything because the drilling was very, very difficult, at least in those days. And I think it still is very difficult to drill into hard rock. So Anne-Marie and I were using the library very actively to find out what, were, what was this really sediment that we were looking at. Well, we lost about three to four bottom hole assemblies, we ran out of equipment for drilling, which required us to make a side trip all the way up to ADAC, Alaska, to pick up new drilling equipment. But once we did do that, we were successful. And we were able to get, from at least three of the seamounts, datable um, uh, mantle or basaltic rocks that could be dated. And as you can see, we were successful in showing that the movement of the hotspot had gone northwest in this time period. So the Glomar Challenger, my, as Helmi mentioned, my next leg was paleoceanography in the South Atlantic, and this leg then opened up the whole field of paleoceanography. It was really the beginning. And in 1981, we had the first paleoceanography conference. 1981, Helmi? Yes, yeah. in Zurich. So as, as Ravel mentioned, and I, he, he, had, he picked up 10 different results for the first 10 years. And I've mentioned already the fixed location of the hotspot and the paleo past and climatic and ecological changes in the ocean. But right now, the two other ones that he mentioned was the drying up and later refilling of the Mediterranean Sea, something that we call the Mycenaean salinity crisis now, and the discovery of, of resource-rich deposits. And by these resource-rich deposits, I want to focus on gas hydrates. What was never, oops, sorry. I just turned it, okay. What was never mentioned at all in the first 10 years was the deep subsurface biosphere. But we knew it was there. There was in indications that there was active microbial activity. We just never really knew how to, to, to focus in on it. And I hope that Fumio Inagaki in his presentation will bring this further, bring us up to date on what's really happening with the deep subsurface biosphere. Well, I want to just mention then this Mycenaean salinity crisis and focus on anoxic dolomite precipitation in association with the Mycenaean salinity crisis. Now, what they were doing is they were actually seeking to understand the presence of these reflectors. I could have underlined them, the reflector M. And what was it? Well, you only could find out by drilling it. And in, in the end, what it was is you have this lithological change where you have continental evaporites and directly overlying them, you have what is the, what we call the Pliocene. It's essentially a lithostratigraphic change here, the Pliocene, um, uh, which is normal pelagic sediment. So how can this happen? Well, this was the, the what you see here in the diagram <clears throat> is the Cheetah and Ryan interpretation of of what might have happened. The Mediterranean simply got disconnected from the, uh, the North Atlantic. It dried out, and we had uh, evaporite being deposited in the deeper parts of the basin. Well, this was really a focus of a lot of interesting um, uh, um, discussions. And I can remember Ken Shu in Zurich was always saying, I don't care, I work for posterity. I don't care if they don't believe it, this happened. I work for posterity. So we're still discussing what happened during that time um, in the late Miocene. But this major paper, which was published in 1973, 45 years ago, this breakthrough article was published based on the results of DSDP 13. And there's been numerous publications, and many of you may be in the audience here, I see some people who have worked on this problem too, over the years. Well, there, had, there were follow-up legs, uh, 42A, ODP 107, 160, and 161. But 
There has not been a new drilling campaign there since 1995. Um, and this is the focus now of a major group of European scientists together with some international colleagues to go back. It's called the MedSalt, the, co the cost action. We have submitted a new proposal, IODP uh, 857 pre-proposal, the demise of a salt giant. And our goal is to try to understand the climatic and environmental transitions that occurred during the terminal Mycenaean salinity crisis in where focus, our focus is on the eastern, central and eastern Mediterranean basins. We had another proposal in here, which we called the dream, which was to drill a transect of holes down the Balearic, Balearic margin. But to date, we are unable to get the seismic surveys that will allow us to go in there to drill. But we're hoping, as the drill ship the Doherty's resolution comes into the North Atlantic that perhaps we will be able to do drilling maybe as early as 2022. And the dream is still alive. We're still working on getting the seismic surveys that we need to undertake this. Okay, so my focus then, my interest was <clears throat> looking back at the, and I think if you go back into the old DSDP volumes, there's amazing amount of interesting data and papers there. And the focus of the, 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 uh, the focus of the part of the project that I'm working on is dealing with the Ionian Basin and what occurred at Site 374. Now I know there's a lot of information in this site, but just take it down here. We're trying. We're proposing an actualistic model for the origin of massive dolomite deposits associated with the salt giants, other salt giants in the rock record. And we are proposing, based on one drill hole and the seismic, and this is the old original seismic that was used to drill. We're. Uh, you'll see we have cores 11 to 15, which cross the boundary. These are dolomites. They contain dolomite. Um, uh, Dolomitization is now occur we believe is now occurring in into the earliest Pliocene sediments. Well, I was lucky enough, Christian Hoopshire at the University of Hamburg proposed to me last summer that he had four days of ship time. Let's go there and do let's survey this area. Now this area then is covering the this is the original proposed lines. Um, that this pre-site survey to, to actually accompany our drilling proposal. The results were, here is the new beautiful seismic survey. This is the first interpretation of Christian. And what you see here is we have this really reflective horizon here. And this horizon, it, we believe, represents this dolomite unit. Above, you have the nicely layered Pliocene. So we have the A unit. The, the, the three is the so-called Logomari dolomite, a lake, an alkaline lake deposit, and two, the unit two, the covers above that is the dolomitization of the carbonate sediments of the earliest Pliocene. Okay, what does this represent, and why do we think this is a giant? Well, if you look here, Christian made this estimate of the area covered based on the, the seismic lines. There's five cross lines, a total of 10 lines, north and south, he estimates this area maybe represents the, where this very uh, significant unit of dolomite has been deposited. You look at it, it's almost the same size as Sicily, so it's gigantic. And um, another way of looking at it, if we go up to what we all know are the beautiful mountains, the Triassic reefs of the dolomites in Italy, these mountains, not in magnitude, but in the area covered by the Dolomites, it represents maybe, you could put seven of them. The size of this area would contain seven Dolomite mountains. Well, that is kind of what I wanted to say about uh, the Mycenaean salinity crisis and where the future direction might be going with drilling there. And I, I would like to also mention that do Anoxic Dolomite was recognized uh, precipitating first on the uh, Gulf of California bar and the California margins in the early, um, late 17, uh, around 1978. And this subsequently was found dolomite precipitation in many other areas. And I think this is where we have a very strong recognition of the association between the deep biosphere and the uh, diagenesis that is going on 
uh, in relationship to the deep biosphere ac activity and the precipitation of these diagenetic minerals. And this is also a, a, a very big area of future research. So for my last discovery, going back to Ravel's original 10, um, I want to focus on the gas hydrate formation. And I think this is a very interesting one, well, excuse me, because they first recognized that there was gas in the deep sea sediments in 1971, drilling on the Blake Bahama outer ridge. And all they ever recovered was gas, but a lot of very disturbed cores. So they went back there in, um, uh, they went back there in 1980, attempting to then uh, recover the gas hydrates. And what you see, uh, once again, what are we drilling? We're drilling to a seismic boundary. In this, in this case, it's not the M reflector, as in the Mediterranean, which represents this uh, evaporite deposit. In this case, it is this so-called BSR, or bottom seismic reflector. And it's below this BSR that they thought they would find um, the gas hydrates. And this is what leads to the production of this um, consequence of having this reflector in the seismic profiles. Okay, they did recover a little bit of gas hydrate. As you can see, it's only one centimeter. And it's very small, and it was not very convincing. So another leg that was uh, planned was planned for 1995. Leg. Now we're in the o o ODP times. They went back and drilled. And this, the idea behind it, and I remember this because I was part of the panel at the time, was that you would sneak up on the gas hydrate. In fact, you would drill off the edge of the BSR and then drill into it. So first we drilled, was to drill 994. Shouldn't be any gas there, but they found gas there. They had gas hydrates, even where there's not a BSR, if I remember correctly. But they were very successful in obtaining uh, very beautiful cores using uh, very sophisticated new drilling equipment. And here you see the bubbling gas out of it. Very splendid uh, recovery of the gas hydrate. A success, a major success. Well, where are we going here from here in this future? Um, the deep sea economic deposits, uh, gas methane hydrates do represent deep sea economic deposits. And this is a very controversial issue. Uh, I don't know if anyone was in Anjay Bach's uh, talk yesterday, uh, where she spoke about um, the, the consequences of mining the deep sea floor. But I think we have to consider this as a potential future source of hy hydrocarbon fuel. And my good friend Ryo Matsumatu um, sent me these pictures of some really, now these are beautiful cores. If you think about what uh, the transition that has been made, uh, and these are the gas hydrates, thick, massive deposits of gas hydrates that have been recovered along the, uh, in the Sea of Japan here. Well, it is an energy source. It does burn. So I think it is something that we're going to have to be dealing with in the future. So this brings me to my odyssey, back to my odyssey, which uh, of ocean discovery, which, as Helmi mentioned, I had three more, I had three additional cruises outside of DSDP, ODP, uh, Northeast Australian Margin, the Palmas Transect, and the Terranean Sea. And you might ask, why did I stop going to sea in 1996? Why was that my last one? Well, Switzerland's a small country. We only have membership, our membership only allows us to send one person per year. And so I became a professor in 1996. It was time to send off the students and the postdocs, like Mickey Strasser, Miriam Andres, Patrick Meister. There were a number of students, not only at the ATH, but throughout Switzerland, who had the same adventure that I was able to have. But my participation doesn't end the ocean drilling program. We have moved on to the integrated ocean drilling program, the former IODP, and IODP II, the international discovery program. The science is still going forward. We now have a variety of drill ships. We have the Chikyu, the uh, riser driller, the Joides Resolution, which is the old workhorse of many, many years, and the e contribution of mission-specific platforms de designed for specific drilling projects. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to give that away. You'll, <laughs> you'll notice, okay, I've been using this background photograph 
uh, for a number of the past slides. And it shows you where all the drill holes have been throughout the whole program, throughout the 50 years. This is the number of drill holes that we have in our ocean. Our ocean, which covers 70% of the Earth. And the most recent one, the Expedition 374 in the Ross Sea, just ended. And that is site U1525. So as of today, I believe there might be one more, but we have 1,525 drill holes into our vast ocean. And you might ask, why do we need to continue? Why do we need to go beyond 50 years? Well, many people say, we know the surface of Mars much better than we know the surface of our own oceans and what lies beneath it. And so I would propose then that we have some many, some. Uh, related to some of our past, but our future directions, some fundamental problems that need to be solved. Fundamental exploration, such as the Mediterranean mass of salt deposits. Our future goal is actually to drill through the salt. What do we have below it? These are really interesting questions. And mapping and evaluation of extent of environmental hazards versus exploitation, the potential of methane locked up in gas hydrates, these are all issues that are future directions that we as scientists or marine scientists, drill scientists, need to be probing. And also the systematic probing of the nature and extent of the deep biosphere. I think this is one of the, <laughs> the most important things that we're looking at today. What is down there? What are they doing? How, how did they get there? Uh, the function of them. And also their association with in situ diagenesis. These are very important questions that we in the ocean, International Ocean Drilling Program can attack. And as you know, I'm a sedimentologist, a geochemist. I have not touched upon many, many other aspects of successes of the Ocean Drilling Program. And I hope in this following, my following, the speakers who will be following me will bring these, a clearer picture of these topics to you. What I've tried to do is bring you my impression of what the first 50 years in, uh, uh, contained. And um, I would say it's 50 years, and we're still sailing strong into the future. And I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Judy. You have shown how really inter and multidisciplinary this project is going from geophysics, tectonics to stratigraphy, paleoceanography, geobiology, and many other fields. Uh, is there any question? Should we have time for one or two questions to Judy? Or additional comments? Uh, I, I would just comment. I mean, it's been my great pleasure to have worked with many of you in this audience. And not only to sail with you, but also the participation in the act, the act of participation in planning and the execution of this, of this wonderful program. It has been, it, it made my career, I have to say that. Being part of the ocean drilling program, was a, it's a career maker. And I'm sure there's some young scientists in the audience who will agree with me on this. Okay. Do you have the mic? Um, uh, do we have a microphone there? Yeah. Could you say two words uh, about the achievements of the IODP uh, against the Russian deep drilling program? Could you comment? Two words. Uh, well, I can remember, as I mentioned, um, uh, we had a Russian vessel with us, but we also had Russian scientists involved. The, the first leg I was on, 55, there was a Russian petrologist who sailed with us. Um, I, the, the Russian drilling is continental drilling, I believe. And um, I think it's kind of like a, I'm not a drilling specialist, but I think it's a very different approach when you're drilling on land or you're drilling at, at sea. And uh, the equipment is very different. And the... Um, what you need for an expedition on land is difficult. It's tough too, but it's very different. And the, they're complementary. And we also have the International Continental Drilling Program, which is very much linked. And some of our drilling campaigns have linked drilling on the continent together with drilling in the ocean. So I think they're compl complementary. And we, 
I'm not speaking, I was just presenting my impressions of how my experiences were, but some other people could get up and talk about continental drilling. In maybe, association yeah, and with- Maybe it's the moment to say we have our ICDP and IODP session, the regular session, tom tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 10 o'clock. Good. Tomorrow. Very good, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very, uh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Judy. Let's go on to the next speaker. So, our next speaker is Ulla Röhl. We know her from the ocean drilling community. She's a scientist, senior scientist at Marum Bremen University. Well, Ulla is, first of all, a palaeoceanographer. Second, she is, how would I call it, the librarian, librarian of the Earth Archive. We come back to that. But uh, she participated in, if I'm correct, six ODP and IODP expedition as a sailing scientist and then in several other ones on, uh, on shore, as an onshore scientist. Then, very important, um, she will be co-chief on Expedition 378 at the end of this year uh, to the South Pacific Paleogene, it's a climate paleoceanography lake. And Ursula is, has been very active in European ocean drilling activities. She's a science operator, ESO, and very important. I think I love that place in Bremen, I have to say. It, it's the core repository, which is a piece of art. And uh, we have there that the history of our oceans are there and two other places stored. So it's the most valuable place you're managing sort of a side of your science. I think, Ola, please come up on stage and the title Delving Deep into the Sea Floor. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Helmi, many thanks for your kind introduction. I would also like to thank the conveners of this session for selecting me to give this presentation. It's certainly an honor. And I, of course, 50 years of ocean drilling, it's a lot what happened during this time. So I will give a personal flavor of what this uh, meant to me. Judy introduced you to the main achievements and some of her personal experience of the deep sea drilling project. Then the Joydis resolution was the centerpiece of the ocean drilling program. And then since 2003, with the start of the integrated ocean drilling program and now the international discovery program, we have this multi-platform approach, which added a lot because we not only have several drilling vessels, but also can achieve new technical uh, challenges and uh, with the MSPs also uh, have some additional uh, area we could, can address like ice covered areas and shallow water. So why should we care about drilling mud and rocks in the sea, why bother? I just very roughly from a paleoceanography point of view mention a few reasons, definitely Ocean drilling results refine the geological time scale as determined through paleomagnetic rocks, uh, records, radiometric dating, and the occurrence of marine microfossils. Then the sedimentary record was extended from present day back to almost 200 million years. And this is very crucial uh, for the reconstruction of the planet history and life at high resolution. Uh, in the oceans, and uh, especially during times of tremendous change and adaptation. And of course, and this is a big thing in Cenozoic paleoceanography, uh, the linkage between orbital variability and what we decipher from the sedimentary record and the relation to climate changes. Altogether, 
We got a lot of sites, many hundred kilometers of course so far. So this is a big archive and that's why I can only present some snapshots uh, of what has been achieved over the past decades or so. I start with my personal relation to the timeline of the ODP, IODP. I first got in touch in 1988 when I started my first postdoc and I was an onshore participant of ODP Leg 122, Exmouth Plateau, and then later sailed on Leg 143 Atolls and Gius 1, then uh, 165 in the Caribbean Sea. And what really overwhelmed me in all these expeditions was that I was a member of an international and multidisciplinary team. And this is something really outstanding and then uh, one, uh, beside the team spirit that also old meets young, this was something which is really, or still is something which is uh, mainly driving uh, the work during this expedition. Then another onshore participation in uh, Blake Nose, then sailed in the Tasman Sea with, with Jim Kennett uh, and Neville Exon as co-chief scientist then on the Schatzky Rise, where we were at sea on 9-11, and uh, Lake 208 on the Walvis Ridge in the South Atlantic. And then with Carlotta Escutia as one of the co-chief scientists uh, on Wilkes Land Margin, Antarctica. Where did it all begin? Yeah, and then later, I also participated in onshore uh, mode on uh, Newfoundland uh, drift sediments, and later this year I will serve as the co-chief scientist in the South Pacific. All these expeditions, you know the map already, Judy showed this, are quite distributed over different oceans and ocean basins and latitudes. So, what they all have in common, almost all of them uh, were targeting some part of the Cenozoic, and uh, especially I'd like to focus now on the early Cenozoic, the time interval between about 34 to 66 million years. And I want to go back to this curve this year there is also the anniversary of six decades of the Keeling curve, the CO2 concentration measurements done at the Mauna Loa Observatory. And you see here that during these six decades, the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere increased by 90 ppm. So you think 90 ppm, okay, oh, that's something. I want to put it into a context. So here the record is extended by adding ice core data, and you see that uh, switch from glacial to interglacial is already between 80 and 90 ppm, but during this switch, uh, the timing is totally different. So it took um, uh, thousands of years to get, uh, get to this increase. Whereas nowadays, uh, as you now know, we have this instrumental record over six, uh, six decades. So it's really important that we look into and study past warm climate because uh, 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 the instrumental records cannot fully provide the information uh, we need. So what was the first isotope record, or one of the first isotope records? This is, these are uh, oxygen isotope data analyzed by Nick Shackleton and uh, Jim Kennett on a site in the Southwest Pacific on the Campbell Plateau, site 27779. I need to emphasize that these are single holes which have been drilled at that time. And you may wonder why there is no scale on the x-axis and it's not uh, meters or depths or age or anything. 
it, they just plotted the data sample by sample in equal distance. But with a trained eye of what we know now, and they got biostrat information, of course, already shipboard, and with the information we already know now, uh, we can already see that this curve clearly exhibits the Eocene oligocene transition, then also the early Eocene climatic optimum, and for example, also the middle Eocene climatic optimum, and maybe uh, the mid Miocene climatic optimum. So, all of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with the uh, uh, Sachos curve shown here, and the CO2 proxies plotted in the upper panel there uh, indicate the effect of uh, greenhouse gases on climate and, and show the, the warming in the older part of the Cenozoic. The isotope data are shown here as a function of temperature, and you see the increased cooling, but the inc cooling uh, wasn't continuously. It happened in different pulses, and what was really coming out of ocean drilling was that there are transient warming events with the most prominent, the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, which later uh, became a stage boundary. And uh, so I zoom in here a little bit. And it all started with that before it was known that this was a warming event, it was initially identified on the Maud rise in the Southern Ocean as a so-called benthic foraminifera extinction event. Because as you can see, it's really outstanding that very sudden there is a dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, reduction, not only in, in numbers, but also uh, in diversity. And for example, this is uh, much more dramatic than, for example, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. So this was uh, already known for some while, as also on land, some uh, biotic perturbations at the same time. And it was only that the uh, Mortry section site 690 then showed the first data published in 91, uh, that there was a dramatic warming and uh, coinciding with a negative carbon isotope anomaly at that time. Meanwhile, an example here now from uh, Walvis Ridge, we, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, sections for the PETM, and here is a transect over, a depth transect over two kilometers, and you see they have all in common that they have a clay layer, clay layer with no carbonate in it. The only difference is that the clay layer becomes thinner with uh, uh, shallowing of the site, so this really is what to be expected if you think about uh, the CCD uh, that arose. And then uh, also shown here uh, how the benthic foraminifera uh, behaved at that time, or uh, the size distribution. At that time, and Thomas and Jim Sachos were already speculating there must be more than one of this uh, hyperthermal event and that it's really needed to study uh, in more detail uh, and more high resolution records. And there are, of course, periodic dissolution hor horizons uh, in the course, as you can see here. You may wonder why I uh, have chosen this picture, but this is a core which has been drilled in 1918, and it was rotary cord, and that's why the quality is not uh, that good. But going back there with the advanced piston core, uh, you can see uh, how nice the core quality uh, has been improved uh, through uh, applying these drilling techniques. So several of these dissolution horizons, warming events, uh, could be identified. So this brings me to a quick uh, turn to some technical improvements. Uh, piston coring 
of two or more offsite holes uh, began in 1979 with DSTP leg 68, and the multiple hole coring is standard uh, since leg 94. And what does it mean, multiple hole coring, that not just one core is drilled as a given location because you always have to keep in mind that the top of a given core may be disturbed and that also some material at the end of the uh, penetration uh, interval is missing. And so by drilling offset holes, it's possible to combine a so-called splice or composite record, which is really then complete. And uh, this was first uh, applied also during leg 94 while they were using core photographs to correlate between holes. And then really during leg 138 in the Equatorial Pacific, uh, they applied in detail this composite depth section approach and uh, also that this was monitored in real time so that it could influence drilling decisions during the expedition. And uh, um, a major uh, thing was also then sailing stratigraphic correlators, so a new role at that time uh, during these expeditions uh, who are in charge of taking care uh, to handle this data and do the correlations. Another achievement which has been uh, gained is that non-destructive core measurements are crucial to get uh, data in the necessary resolution and quality and in a, a, a given time. And typically it started with physical uh, core logging, so magnetic susceptibility, for example, density or P-wave velocity, then color measurements and so on. And then since two decades, especially also XIF scanning at the surface of split core uh, has been uh, becoming very prominent and it has a lot of advantages over physical properties as physical properties often ju just are indirect proxies, whereas uh, XRF scanning data can be more directly interpreted, like if you have calcium uh, intensities from XRF scanning, then there, uh, in, in most cases you can directly link it to carbonate content, for example. And in general, the high signal to noise ratio is uh, of favor and so on. To show you an example, these are core images from three adjacent holes. And you, as you can see, uh, there is some structure in these core images, but uh, core scanning data so, uh, show much more of variation. Uh, the black line at the base is A star, that's one of the color reflectance values. The red is then iron from XRF scanning, and uh, uh, the, the, the thicker black line are isotope data. Uh, so this is really the centerpiece these days to uh, combine uh, composite records and also correlate holes, uh, uh, and later also to astronomically calibrate the records. We have been done this for the PETM, for example, early on that we have identified cycles within XRF scanning data, whereas bulk or benthic isotope records showed some structure, but not to that detail. And then we could multiply the number of cycles with a given Milankovitch periodicity and uh, estimated the age. And uh, we could validate this information by uh, correlating cycle by cycle sites from different areas. And uh, uh, so this was really uh, a big step toward orbital tuning of the early Cenozoic records. And uh, zooming out further, then you can see the high frequency um, precession cycles modulated by eccentricity cycles and uh, uh, um, among the record uh, before and after the PTM. This brings up to the 
course, the archives we've got, and the, all the course drilled over the five decades are distributed in only three core repositories in relation to this regional criteria. So the Gulf Coast Repository uh, holds all the core from most of the Pacific Ocean and the Southern Ocean. The Kochi Core Center from the Indian Ocean and the very Western Pacific Ocean and the Bremen Core Repository, the cores from the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, Arctic Ocean, Black and Baltic Seas. And if you uh, look at the ceiling for a moment. These are uh, directly the dimensions of our reefer in Bremen, uh, the rack size, and uh, we house 156 kilometers of core at this stage from the mentioned ocean. And as it is quite boring to show an empty reefer, I also show you this picture. Uh, we recently hold the onshore science party for the Corinth expedition with uh, Lisa McNeil uh, as one of the co-chief scientists. She will talk after me. And uh, so this was also a nice spot for a group picture at that time. At Bremen, many visitors come to look at course, to sample course. We also hold so-called sampling parties which is when the whole science team of a given expedition visits to systematically sample score from a given expedition. You see it's also a lot of work, but people enjoy and have fun at times. And then for the mission-specific platform expedition, the cores are not split at sea because of the size of the ships and platform used. And so we defer the splitting of the cores and undertaking all the IOTP measurements to Bremen, and we recently had the Corinth group at Bremen for a month where we were also working in shifts and uh, did all the work. Coming back to the Sachos curve at this stage, I just very briefly showed some curves and data, but we have to keep in mind that this is a multi-site record. So what does it mean in detail? There is this interval, 45 to about 66 million year plotted, and you see that combining data from various sites is uh, producing a record which is definitely beyond uh, orbital Milankovic uh, resolution, and therefore uh, approach from many groups around the world is to, to get data which are um, single site data or even single species data because uh, that's the information we need in the fidelity we also need to, to move on to deliver the Xenozoic Paleoceanography. That's site 1262 from Warwick Ridge again. And here you see XRF data and bulk isotope data and uh, the record has been orbitally tuned and uh, you can imagine that all the details shown here uh, are not sticking out of the Sachos compilation. And also uh, now single species records are available. This is just an example for 52 to 60 million years. Again, XRF data, then coarse fraction data, then oxygen and carbon isotope, uh, uh, benthic oxygen and carbon isotope data, and also the bulk record. And uh, you can see that new features, which we haven't explained yet, stick out of these new records. And meanwhile, at, especially at these sites, we have information uh, over almost 19 million years now, and there are many groups uh, working on this, to compile these records. It's uh, Santa Cruz and Utrecht and Bremen and Edinburgh and uh, Falmouth uh, and so on. So uh, we started also, for example, comparing uh, Pacific and Atlantic records, and it's uh, visible that with these new events which are 
sticking out of this high resolution data. There is some consistency between the oceans, so these events are clearly global in nature. And uh, showing this curve again, you may have realized that I mainly showed data from the Paleocene and early Eocene. So many records are still needed, especially for the middle Eocene and the late Eocene. So it's not that we are done yet or already have all the information we need. And uh, just a, a small story that we also went on land to calibrate our deep sea data. This is the Paleocene, Eocene terrestrial record in the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming. And with a group of American colleagues, we drilled a set of cores. And with this course, we could do the same kind of measurements we do with deep sea cores. And this has been recently published that uh, the correlation of this terrestrial cores and the deep sea cores uh, now are congruent in terms of the details of the age models. You have to keep in mind that the deep sea cores, these are just a few sections, whereas the terrestrial record is tens of meters long. I've shown some, very quickly, some examples, and these are the sites where you can really undertake this long-term uh, investigation and studies. So, Given of the ocean areas available, this is not very much, so we have to do more. And you may notice that there are some areas where there is no core available yet. And uh, the scheduled expeditions already start filling some of these gaps. And the expedition we go to in the fall is South Pacific Paleogene. We target this area. And these are the sites uh, in the South Pacific. They are identified by the age of the seafloor. So we uh, target some sites to get uh, Paleocene sediment and younger, or uh, late Eocene sediment and younger. And we'll see. And we also will, this will be the first site, we drill DSDP site 277. And, uh, I skip the, uh, the uh, objectives, and I'm running out of time. But this now concludes the loop. I started with this record. I mentioned that this is a single hole. It was only spot caught. And during this expedition, for example, we will be uh, redrilling this site as a along the standards as of today with multiple hole drilling and composite records and so on. It's an important location in this part of the Pacific. And uh, with this, I stop here. I'd like to thank all my collaborators. It has been and still is a great endeavor to be part of this community. And I'd also like to thank ECORD, IODP, the programs, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and Marum and the University of Bremen that they let me do what I like to do and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Ola, for your opening the window into paleoceanography. We have time for one comment question. There is of course, people have to come in, come out, and that's at the moment. Well, I think we then move on, and I give the word to Gilbert. I'm leaving the stage. And Thank you, Helmi. So so I'm Gilbert Camo, I'm managing e so it means the European contribution to IODP. I'm in charge now of introducing the two next speakers, and the first one will be Lisa McNeil. I was told by Lisa that uh, the introduction should be short because she needs the time. Okay, I will be short then. Lisa is professor of tectonics at the uh, uh, Ocean and Earth Science Depart Department for the University of Southampton, based at the National Oceanography Center 
and uh, Southampton, UK. Uh, research focuses on deformation processes within active uh, tectonic regions, but particularly the subduction zones and active continental uh, rifts. I work on active rifting as focused on the natural laboratory of the Korean Rift in the Eastern Mediterranean, and uh, she has particip participated in 16 uh, research, research cruises, and especially four ocean reading expeditions, as, especially as co-chief on Expedition 319 in Nankai, subduction zone, uh, on board the GQ. Uh, on the 362, reading Sumatra, on board the Joidas Resolution, and very recently on board a mission-specific platform for the Expedition 381 on, active, on the active rift of Corinth. That means that she was co-chief on the three IODP platforms. And last thing is that uh, Lisa will take the lead of the science evaluation panel of IODP in early 2019. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa McNeil. We will talk about recent past and future progress in tectonics and dynamic earth processes, meaning that she will cover more or less two science themes of IUDP. I'm sorry for this short introduction, Lisa. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the invitation and for the, the lovely uh, introduction. Um, I think I've actually been on five expeditions, but you know, I think there's, there's many more record keepers um, here for that. That's true, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and cover um, quite a range, um, and I will focus, though, on the more recent um, highlights, because obviously we can't cover everything. Um, we've seen uh, this map in, in different, different forms, but I think it, it highlights, although, as Ulla said, um, there's areas we haven't covered, and there's so much more to do, and the importance of this program, I think it does show the wealth of what has been achieved um, and the coverage that we have obtained. And I just, I'm not going to say too much about my personal experience, um, but uh, I just want to say that for me, I, I see this as, it's an unrivaled program in earth sciences, and I think we probably all agree on that, but in terms of the science that's generated by it and also the, 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 uh, the opportunity for people in terms of young, old, um, inexperienced experience, there's, there's nothing like it, and I hope it's got a, a rosy and stable future. Okay. Rapidly moving on. So as I said before, what I'll try and do is focus on some highlights from the latest phase, uh, looking at tectonics and the earth in motion um, aspects. I can't cover everything, um, but brace yourselves for a, a race through a number of different topics, and hopefully you'll get a flavor for the, for the breadth of what's been achieved um, over this recent, um, recent phase. So I'll look at subduction zones and hazards. Um, I'll also look at subduction initiation arc evolution and fluids. I will spend a little bit of time talking about some of the recent um, work in plate breakup and rifting processes, um, touch on impact cratering, um, and also wanted to say a little bit about um, advances in observatories because these are quite key to these topics. Um, there are of course many things that I can't cover and I apologize for that, um, but when I looked at the sort of the range of talks we were giving, I, I realized that um, there, there obviously, we can't cover everything, so apologies for those areas. And I should also apologise, because I'm trying to cover a range, um, there are many more experts in the audience who I hope will be able to answer your questions, rather than myself. Um, so the second thing I wanted to sort of introduce was um, highlight some of the advances within IODP over the entire programme, but uh, many of them in the last um, sort of 10 to 20 years. Um, and that, again, those advances that are particularly relevant for these topics. First of all, um, the introduction of riser drilling with the Chikyu vessel. And this now means that deep targets are now accessible. We're only really beginning to sort of use this, this methodology, to be honest. Um, but it opens up things that, from the beginning of the program, we've been trying to target and, and haven't been able to yet. There's also a much wider range of methods and platforms for drilling, so including seafloor rock drills, long piston coring, again, meaning that some targets that were previously inaccessible we can now reach. And I think particularly the importance of observatories and downhole measurements and downhole instruments. These have been um, going on from the 90s, from part of our ODP, but uh, the techniques have improved, and now we have better and more in situ and temporal measurements. 
But there's also been improvements in um, how rapidly we can reach deep targets. And that means we can do more, we can reach deeper targets, but we can also do more. And just greater coverage with time and improved core quality, as Ulla was talking about some of the, the techniques there. OK, so before I sort of get started uh, for real, I just wanted to highlight a few um, of the sort of example challenges or some of the targets in these topics. Um, and some of these will sort of have a little bit of a slant towards what I'm interested in. But first of all, um, thinking about one of the current uh, IDP science plan challenges, what mechanisms control the occurrence of destructive earthquakes, landslides, and tsunamis? Um, Mickey's going to talk a little bit more about uh, landslides within this theme. But in terms of earthquakes, in the last 15 years, we have had a series of destructive earthquakes and tsunamis that have really highlighted this particular topic. But they've actually really broken the models that we have. For example, there's been evidence of much shallower earthquake slip than we expected to have. In addition, over the same sort of time period, it's been identified that there's a whole range of ways that faults slip not just our sort of passively slipping, aseismic and earthquake slip, but a whole range of processes in between, which really makes us reevaluate how a fault behaves and what its implications are for hazards. So one example of that is slow slip. Um, and this is currently being targeted, literally, as we speak, um, during Expedition 375. The second thing I wanted to highlight, which is related to Challenge 14, which is about how fluids link to subsea floor processes is the importance of monitoring and in situ measurements. Um, I mentioned before this is one of the advances and this is key and I think we'll hear more about this in some of the subsequent talks. Um, but the ability to instrument holes and to have temporal measurements, um, long time series, sampling measurements over time is really crucial. And the third thing I wanted to mention, which I think is particularly relevant to this topic, is the importance of site survey data. So having the geophysical data that enables you to image the sites, provide the context, and then enable the wider spatial application of those individual sort of pinpricks of, of boreholes that we have to take them over a much wider, wider area. And this is a really key part of, of, of the ocean drilling program. It's not sort of technically within it, but it's a key part of enabling the, the science to happen. So just to bear those in mind, and I'll touch on some of those as we go on. Okay, so the first topic, um, which I'll spend most of my time on, subduction zones and hazards. And the, and the focus here has really been trying to identify what the fault zone properties and behaviours are, and actually using drilling to actually collect samples and to be able to do experiments on those and to measure them. So starting with the, the sort of the biggest program that we have within this, the Nantracise project. This is taking place um, and has been for the last more than 10 years now um, and 12 expeditions on the Nankai Trough uh, margin in Japan. And what we can see here is the, the sort of setup of the, of the project and the transect through it. And you can see the different uh, boreholes that have been drilled and a series of those over these 12 expeditions. It's also been the site of the, uh, the first riser drilling. I was actually on board for this, which was very exciting. Um, so we're looking at this location here. Um, so this is a multi-stage effort to sample and instrument the subduction plate boundary fault and to use riser drilling to actually reach the plate boundary fault where it is seismogenic. This is sort of the ultimate target for this, this um, project and for many of the projects. And I just want to highlight a few of the sort of science science results, and then show you what's happening next. So an example is that from some of the shallow boreholes, the cores that have been collected, using vitronite reflectance data, there's evidence that actually, potentially, there had been high-velocity seismic slip at unexpectedly shallow de depths. So whilst sort of advancing towards drilling and sampling the deeper part of the fault zone, the shallower fault targets have also brought up results that were unexpected. And I mentioned before that this idea of shallow, potentially seismic slip is one that we've, we've only really thought about in the last, last years. Um, so that was just a bit of a snapshot. Um, so what's happening in terms of the deep riser site? So, so far, this is the, the site that's trying to, aiming to reach the uh, plate boundary. This has reached a depth of just over 3,000 meters. This is the deepest borehole in scientific ocean drilling. 
Um, there is a full set of uh, logging while drilling um, logs within this borehole, and then sections of core. And this gives me an opportunity to also highlight the importance of logging, and particularly logging while drilling in these subduction zone environments. Um, this is key to the success of subduction drilling, where hole conditions can often prevent wireline logging, but in situ properties are really key. So there's a focus on um, um, logging the hole and patches of, of coring, and the primary fault target is at a depth of about four and a half to five kilometers, and I'll come back to, to the next stage of that in a moment. The other important aspect of this is installing observatories. So at the moment, and, and actually very recently, there are now observatories, oops, sorry, whoa, going mad. Um, there are observatories installed at three sites, um, and I'll quickly move on to show you that. At the shallow part of the main uh, mega splay fault, the frontal thrust, and the upper part of the deep riser borehole site. And these are collecting, um, include seismometers, strain meters, tilt meters, pore pressure, and temperature measurements. And importantly here, they're also connected to the seafloor network, the donut um, network. So these are just some uh, photos of installation, retrieving um, a temporary observatory, and installing a long-term observatory. And you can see, get a feeling for the scale. Here is a, a normal, normal person. <laughs> On the ship, this is an enormous undertaking, the, the riser drilling and installation of these observatories. And just one highlight in terms of a result from observatory um, investigations. So this is from one of the temporary, two of the temporary observatories. And it showed that uh, there had been um, actually slow slip, this, this um, slip behavior that I mentioned earlier, um, unexpectedly occurring on the shallow part of the plate boundary. And by having two boreholes, what they were able to do was get a very accurate idea of the timing of these events, some of which were linked to earthquakes, both locally and further away, including the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. Um, and also to be able to look at the nature of the slip and the location of the slip in, with a lot of accuracy because of the two boreholes. And they found that these slow slip events are taking up a significant part of the plate convergence. Okay, so the future for this, uh, this location, um, this is Expedition 358 coming up very soon, and the idea is this, this hopefully will be the finale of reaching the plate boundary, fingers crossed, um, to drill down to about 5,000 metres below seafloor um, and to have a coring section um, within the, the plate boundary fault and also to take those all-important downhole in situ measurements of stress and pore pressure. So hopefully this will see a... A, a final um, culmination of all of this work and finally reaching the, the plate boundary. Okay, so another example of a subduction zone, the Sumatra subduction zone. Um, so this is one that I, I was involved in um, and here we've got something slightly different. Here we have a very thick sedimentary input and this is as a result of part of the Bengal Nicobar fan system which we found actually um, could be, the Nicobar fan could actually contain a very important part of the um, Himalayan erosive um, history in this area. Um, so this thick sediment means that we can't actually get to the, the plate boundary fault. It's just too deep. So what we did here was drill the input materials. And we had a hypothesis here from the 2004 earthquake and tsunami that actually slip had occurred much more shallowly than expected. Um, and we hypothesized this might be related to this thick sediment input. And what we found was some interesting geochemistry results. Um, so we found that there was an anomaly of, of chloride, actually a freshening um, within the deep part of the, of the sedimentary section. And here we inferred this is a result of dehydration reactions, diagenetic processes that normally occur within the subduction zone are actually occurring in the sedimentary section before you get there. And this changes the material properties of the sediments, and therefore we, we conclude that this is meaning that the fault properties, uh, the fault is actually stronger in the shallow part of the subduction zone, and therefore seismogenic slip can propagate to very shallow levels. And that means that you have shallow slip, but also a wider rupture zone and larger tsunami. So this is not only significant for future earthquakes on this margin, but also for others that have very thick sedimented margins, particularly maybe the Macron, but also Lesser Antilles and Cascadia. And again, a lot of these places really haven't been um, sampled, particularly the Macron, and probably we never can. There we have seven kilometer, up to seven kilometers of sediment, so we're not going to put in a, a, a proposal for that one. 
Okay, moving on to something slightly different, the Hikarangi margin. So uh, this is currently uh, being drilled at the moment, um, Expedition 375, and Expedition 372 recently occurred, and Mickey will say a little bit about some aspects of that as well. Um, so here in New Zealand, it's one of the places where the slow slip um, occurrences on the plate boundary are occurring at very shallow levels and therefore can actually be reached by drilling. Um, and so this has been a sort of a, a project along in the planning. It's also a function of not only drilling, but also seafloor instrumentation and borehole um, um, pressure gauges on the seafloor, and also a lot of geophysical data collection. So drill sites are being drilled um, across the margin, and observatories will be installed. So this is the sort of first dedicated um, slow-slip uh, drilling expedition. So this is the seismic profile across the margin. Um, and in terms of observatories, so that three sites, four sites are being drilled, um, one in the sort of upper part of the forearc, one in the very shallow part of the, uh, the plate boundary and some input sites, and potentially slow slip may propagate to this shallow depth, or maybe in future there may be the opportunity to drill deeper into the plate boundary. But observatories are being installed at these two sites, and these will be very important. Um, the slow slip here has been identified from GPS on shore, but actually getting data sitting immediately above and in where the slow slip is occurring is absolutely crucial for tying down what this is and why it occurs. And then I highlighted the, the importance of site survey data. And here we can see um, that there's been a lot of activity, including a 3D seismic data set that's been collected. Um, so there's a whole range of activities going on here, but seismic data collection is, is crucial. I will say little about this because I know Mickey's going to talk about the Japan Trench, but this was the site of the, one of the, the largest earthquakes of the last uh, 10 to 15 years with very large slip, again at these shallow depths. I, I'm saying similar things uh, many times here. Um, and here, in contrast to the Sumatra example where we think maybe the fault is strong, here uh, drilling found, and this drilling was occurring actually one year after the earthquake, so very quickly after. Um, they found that the materials in the fault zone are actually very weak, so a particular kind of clay that is very weak. And the idea there is that maybe slip occurred to shallow depths at very high levels because of that weakness. In addition, because of the, the very short time span between the earthquake and the uh, drilling, they were able to take temperature measurements, again, in a, in a sort of short-term um, observatory. And the bottom left diagram shows you the results for that. So they're actually able to measure the, the temperature that are, the dissipating heat and the remaining temperature on, associated with the fault zone and the slip during that earthquake, and from that to be able to infer something about what happened during the earthquake. So this was a very exciting and a very rapid um, put together expedition, and a lovely picture of the, the lovely scaly clay on the right. So as I said, Mickey will say more about future drilling on that margin. And then finally, for subduction zones um, and hazards, I wanted to talk about Costa Rica, which is slightly different, um, traditionally more of a, a, an erosive subduction margin, although clearly there has been um, a range of um, history and processes on this margin. And again, recent expeditions here and 3D seismic data collection, so a combination of these two things, are focused on two things. Um, properties and behavior of the megathrust, again, but also looking at continental mass balance and the sort of growth destructive history of, of a margin of this type. So firstly on the properties of the megathrust, and Paola uh, Vanuki was talking about this yesterday, they've been able to do some experiments on the uh, materials potentially forming the fault zone. At the location that they were drilling, the fault zone appears to be forming in biogenic oozes. So rather than the sort of siliciclastic clay, which is also available, that's where the focus is. So firstly, that highlights the importance of biogenic sediments and then particularly carbonates as potential fault materials and the importance of analyzing multiple um, lithologies. And by doing experimental work on those materials, they found that in order for the fault to actually in, um, form in those carbonate oozes, there had to have been high velocity slip. Otherwise, the fault would have formed in the clays. And therefore, they suggest this also is evidence that there could be high velocity shallow slip. And on the topic of, sort of, of mass balance and erosive history, 
Um, the diagrams on the right are just showing some of the sort of mass balance of sediment it flux into the system um, and within the system. And this is one of the places where you can actually do this from available data. So one of the best places where you can actually look at how continental crust is created, eroded and recycled. And there's been sort of ongoing work also on looking at the history of destruction with sort of two theories in terms of um, how the forearc is growing, whether it's as a function of terrigenous material being added from above or whether it's um, actually undergoing frontal accretion. And all of this fo following a phase of fairly major erosion and removal of material as the Cocos Ridge subducts. Okay, so I wanted to spend a bit of time still in subduction zones, but now talking a little bit more about arcs um, and magmatic and fluid processes. So there's been a lot of focus of activity in the last um, phase on the Izubonin Mariana arc. So three expeditions occurred on the, uh, as part of Project IBM, and their focus was looking at arc evolution and continental crust formation. So the idea was to um, focus on different parts of the, of the, of the arc. So with an expedition in the fore arc, the rear arc, and the remnant arc to put all of this together. And here you can see the sort of geographical context of the Isabon and Marianas arc. So as an example of one of the sites that's been drilled during Expedition 351 on, on the left, showing the history of this arc evolution from the, the sedimentary volcanic products. So they found that they uh, were able to identify when subduction initiated um, and found that this coincides with changes in Pacific plate motion and also that subduction initiation appears to be both spontaneous and then also contemporaneous along the margin. So, an in, so focusing on this idea of how does subduction initiate and what happens. They then find that uh, potentially a juxtaposition of a sort of arc terrain against uh, ocean lithosphere may have actually been the trigger of the subduction initiation here. Then there's an evolution of the arc terrain rifting, seafloor spreading beginning, for arc basalt magmatism starting, and the IBM arc volcanoes are actually built on this oceanic crust produced during subduction initiation. Um, so just so you can see the, the location. So there's some nice cartoons here showing um, the, the different phases of evolution of the arc that have been put together from this series of expeditions. Um, and some of the geochemistry also says something about the, the nature of the, the mantle that's involved in the melting um, and the role of the subducting plate. And they find that to start with, there's decompression melting due to the sinking slab, but with minimal slab input. But then that slab input begins to increase um, as you involve dehydration and melting of the slab, generating bononites. And then there's a change from depleted mantle to upwelling of more fertile mantle with time. And some of the sequence has some similarities to ophiolite. So there's a strong link here between subduction initiation, forex spreading, and ophiolite formation, and building up um, the story behind that. In addition, the drilling also suggests that continental crust, which was one of their other targets, as in how does this form and how does this grow, is produced in oceanic crust, crust arcs when the crust is actually thin. So these are some of the highlights from that series of expeditions. And apologies are... Uh, can't spend too much time on, on, on these. Um, in addition, further south on the margin, the Marianas Convergent Margin was also revisited during Expedition 366. And the focus here was on the serpentinite mud volcanism that's occurring there. Um, so this is an interesting location where, if we quickly switch to this, by looking at the mud volcanoes on the seafloor, they were actually able to tap into processes that are occurring 20 kilometers below on the plate boundary because the fluids that are being generated by the diagenetic and the metamorphic processes are being transported up to the seafloor generating these mud volcanoes. And they include not only the fluids, but also clasts from these fairly sort of high temperature, including blue schist, um, level uh, materials that are brought to the surface. So this recent expedition revisited the area and was able to look at how changes occur across the fore arc, picking up sources of fluids from different depths within the subduction zone. Um, and also what they were also able to do was to revisit and reinstall and prepare boreholes for further observatory installation. So here, this is a key aspect, is actually being able to monitor and sample fluids uh, that are being generated through time across this section. So this is quite an unusual location where 
Drilling can get us so deep, but it can't get us to 20 kilometers depth in these environments, and this is a way to do it. Okay, I'm going to spend a, a short amount of time talking about the other end of the spectrum tectonically from subduction and talk about rifting. With just a couple of examples, I'm going to talk about the South China Sea, and I may, if I have time, talk about the Gulf of Corinth. But I, I gave a talk about that yesterday morning, so if you were lucky enough to be there at 8.30 in the morning, you might have seen that. If not, I will talk about it also briefly at the town hall meeting this evening, so I may skip that part if you don't mind. So the South China Sea, again, has been another area where there's been um, a range of, or a number of expeditions, so a sort of a focused um, um, project. And this is also interesting because it's one of these CPPs, these complementary project proposals, where there is external funding coming into the project, enabling it to happen. So the three expeditions were aiming to cover drilling both within the actual Ocean, ocean lithosphere part of the basin, but also on the margin. So actually provide a transect across the whole system in order to look at the history of opening um, of the South China Sea, oceanic lithosphere evolution, rift-related sedimentation, and also the breakup mechanism of rifting in this, this location. So it offers the opportunity to do this in a self-contained environment. One of those, two of those expeditions, they have an embargo on, on, on their preliminary report as they work on paper, so I can say very little about that, unfortunately. Um, and that's this one here where they're looking at the, uh, the breakup process across the margin. But I can say just very briefly that from the, the earlier expedition, they are able to get at timing and the evolution of um, opening of the South China Sea, so getting a timing of 33 million years for the onset of seafloor spreading. And also from some of the geochemical results, they can tell that there's actually a lower continental crust and a plume contribution to the South China Sea rifting and mantle melting. And we'll, we'll wait and see what the, the other results are from, from the more recent drilling. But one thing to highlight, I think, is again this combination of drilling and seismic data that show that... Uh, what they're able to do here is combine the boreholes with existing seismic data. And yesterday, there were a, a number of, I think it was yesterday or the day before, a number of very nice presentations showing seismic data across the area. So by combining these two, you've got, a, a first, a good calibration of the sedimentary record. So the ground truthing of the stratigraphy that tells you about the history of the rifting process here. So some very exciting um, results to come on this, I'm sure. Okay, so in the interest of time, I will spend a very short moment mentioning the current active rift development and then encourage you all to come along to the town hall meeting where I'll say, say a little bit more. But just the, to highlight what this was about, um, the idea here is to actually look at a rift just in the very earliest phases of opening. Um, so here we have a, a rift that's only a few million years old, and this is the first time this, is, this sort of um, part of the rifting system has been targeted by drilling. And in addition, the Corinth Rift is very rapidly extending and filling with sediments. And therefore, by drilling the rift sediments, we can actually get a very high resolution, um, temporal and also spatial um, record of the history of the rifting and how it's evolved through time. So just recently, just at the end of last year, and then in February, as Ulla mentioned, we were able to drill three holes here. I was very successful um, on the Fugro Synergy. This is one of these mission-specific platforms. And not only were we able to get um, the, the data that we hope that will generate the chronology to enable this high-resolution record, but also some really interesting records of fluctuating environment as sea level um, interacts and, and moves up and down through time in the Lake Quaternary. We have a basin that transitions from marine to isolated back and forth. And so a really interesting environmental history here as well. So if you'd like to hear more, come along to the town hall. So I'm just going to finish up talking about impact craters and observatories, and then I will, I promise I will stop. So one of the very exciting um, expeditions that um, sort of loosely fits into the topic, and I didn't know if anybody else would talk about it, is drilling of the Chicxulub impact crater. Um, and so the, very, the focus here uh, was not only getting a stratigraphic record and a paleontological record, but also to look at models of crater formation. So hypotheses had been made as to how something called the peak ring has formed, um, but it wasn't known. And the idea of this is that materials are weakened and actually flow during and immediately following the impact, but it was not known what the mechanism was. So this drilling was undertaken in part to look at that. 
And what they found from the sequence of, of uh, materials was that due to the sort of juxtaposition position of the different materials and also the, the shock pressures that they were able to measure from the um, materials, including shock quartz and shatter cones um, and the melt rock, they were able to determine that the, a particular model that had been debated for many years, one of a dynamic collapse of these over-heightened peaks, um, was the model that works here. And some beautiful um, examples of cores that were collected from this, and there have been some nice posters showing those as well. And they are also able to capture the, the immediate you know, timing just around the impact as well. And I think it's really exciting to see that you've got a record that potentially is sort of years and moments um, immediately after impact and look only, not only at the paleontology there and how that's evolved and recovered, but also evidence potentially for tsunamis and standing waves and deposits associated with those in the Gulf of Mexico as a result of the impact. So some really exciting results there. And then just to finish, I promise, um, I wanted to say a few words about how everybody's looking at their watch thinking, goodness me, hurry up. Um, how there have been advances in observatories from the beginning of observ observatories in ocean drilling in the 90s to present. Um, and this all began with um, a sort of uh, sketch on a napkin by Earl Davis and others and Keir Becker and Bob Carson and has led to an evolution of different observatories through time. Um, they appreciated that you really needed to seal off the system so that you could actually get valid in situ measurements. And there's been advance from single um, corks to multi-sealed zones by packers. And you can see how the system has evolved um, through time here. Instrumentation has been added. Early on, there was pressure, temperature, and fluid samplers. samplers. Now there's strain and tilt meters and seismometers. And also simpler, cheaper, easier to install temporary observatories. Um, that are temporary before one of these larger and very expensive um, things can be installed. In two places on the planet, these are connected to the seafloor networks that exist. So the Nankai Dunet network and also the Cascadia Juan de Fuca Neptune network. So you can actually get live data being streamed from these systems. And in all, 30 boreholes have been instrumented with observatories in environments that range from mid-ocean ridges through to subduction zones. So major advances and increasing numbers of holes um, being, being monitored. OK, I'm finally finishing. Um, I won't read my, my conclusions, um, but uh, I'll leave those with you. And then a very large thank you for your time and also to many people who contributed um, to this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for this very comprehensive talk. Uh, we have time for one short question. If not, Coffee. we will reconvene at 10.30 here. And I would like to thank Lisa McNeil as well as Judy McKenzie and Ulla Roel for giving very brilliant talks this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks to come back on time. Please take a seat. Before we introduce the next speaker, I would like to remind you that tonight we have the uh, IUDP ICDP town hall meeting. Uh, that will be at 7 in room K2. There are, um, of course, uh, different reasons to attend it. First, you will get four nice talks, two news and views from the two programs, and two science talks. 
And the even better reasons will be that you will have free drinks and also free discussions. Okay, so please come and attend this town hall meeting. So the next speaker uh, will be Carlota Escuria, who is a senior research scientist at the Institut Andaluz de Ciencias de la Tierra, de la Tierra in Granada, Spain. Uh, Carlota has been active for more than 20 years, uh, um, in, especially in, the, in this program, and uh, uh, research themes concern the ice sheet evolution, the sea level change over the last 35 million years. She has been involved in the program for a long time, of course, not only as a scientist, but of, uh, also as a staff scientist when she was working for uh, uh, TAMU. And um, uh, recently, she has been uh, a co-chief scientist on IUDP Expedition 318 on the Antarctic. Uh, she has served in man many, uh, many uh, science committees in uh, IUDP, and her next uh, endeavor in uh, IUDP will be to be co-chief on a future MSP expedition next year or the year after on the Antarctic Cenozoic Paleoclimate. My pleasure to introduce Carlota Escutia, who will talk about a review on paleoceanography and paleoclimatology in ocean science programs. Thank you, Thank you so much, much. Carlota. Well, thank you very much, Gilbert, for the kind introduction and also for Helmut and uh, Juliana for inviting me to give this uh, presentation to you today. And this is 50 years of ocean drilling in the fields of paleoceanography and paleoclimatology and therefore very hard to cover in a 30 minutes talk. So um, I did organize it in a way that first I will give an overview of how the different programs, the deep sea drilling program and the uh, ODP, the ocean drilling program, uh, advances in these fields of science, and then um, we will have uh, a little bit uh, more focused uh, discussions in the most recent uh, findings uh, through, the, through the IODP, the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, and the future and ongoing work uh, through this phase of the program, the discovery uh, program. Um, first of all, uh, for these uh, fields, of course, since the first uh, leg of the SDP, as um, uh, Judy very well uh, mentioned, and also in the introduction of uh, Helmut, uh, there were many, many findings since the very beginning. There was such, uh, so little was known uh, uh, in the oceans and about um, the characteristics, uh, the differences in temperature uh, in, the, in the water of the sea surface of the oceans and the uh, bottom waters. The, uh, Messinian salts, like uh, Judy mentioned, the um, extension of the, uh, the glaciations uh, to the late Oligocene when they were thought to have started in the Quaternary uh, before the drilling took place. So there were many, many, many discoveries. But uh, one of the things that really made a jump uh, for the fields of paleoceanography and paleoclimatology were the um, innovations in technology, the, the uh, coming of the hydraulic piston core uh, at the uh, end of the DSDP, and uh, the improvements that were made during the uh, ODP uh, for the advanced pinstone core, and also the extended core barrel, which uh, permitted to, to drill uh, into the indurated materials when the APC was not able to advance. And the key point is that uh, with uh, previous uh, coring uh, in the rotary core, the core came all jumbled up, all this, sorry, all disturbed, while with these techniques, the core went, uh, came up uh, to, the, to the rig floor and disturbed. And that really, really allowed for, for great advances in this field. The other thing that also Ulla uh, was mentioning was the, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, multiple cores were taken at a single site. And this, uh, this allowed for obtaining a complete stratigraphic section and uh, I will not go in detail here, but you get uh, different holes and you can see how sometimes you miss some of, some of the section in one, but you get it in another one, and you can make a complete section uh, of, the, uh, of the site that you are drilling. And again, this is true always with these, uh, these uh, soft materials and the, the little indurated that can be recovered with the XCV. When you go back in time and you want longer term uh, paleoclimatic uh, records, then you have to usually go to the rotary core and then you are back to, but usually by then you have indurated materials that are easily um, uh, less disturbed. So um, 
Since uh, it was uh, Lake 68 that uh, first used the uh, hydraulic piston corer, and just right there uh, in that uh, expedition, they were able to extend the isotopic uh, oxygen isotopic record back to 3.5 uh, million years, and uh, correlated with what it was known until that time, that was the uh, isotopic record back to 1 million years that had been recovered through uh, piston coring uh, in the different oceans. And they were able to correlate uh, this uh, record with those piston core records, giving an idea that the changes were similar and starting to think that this um, climate history uh, uh, that was uh, containing the oceans had a uh, global significance. The uh, first uh, expedition that uh, did uh, a multiple coring at one site was uh, Leg 94, and that was in the North Atlantic. And as Ulla said, the, the composite section at that time was made uh, using the uh, photographs that were taken uh, on the ship uh, much later on with these, uh, these continuous um, um, uh, data like the XRF scanner and the physical properties. But uh, this was the first uh, expedition that uh, did quantify the change in the, the uh, orbital forcing uh, going from, uh, from the obliquity-dominated forcing in the uh, Pliocene to the eccentricity in the uh, Pleistocene. And the causes we still um, are scratching our heads over this. But uh, the, uh, even though the, the, the um, DSDP was not the first one, to, to talk about the orbital forcing into the uh, climate variability that we saw in the cores. It is true that these, uh, these uh, deep cores that the ocean drilling program did collect uh, did produce a huge advance in the fields of paleoclimate and paleoceanography. And uh, actually, the main thrust of the scientific uh, objectives for the ocean drilling program was to study this long and short-term short orbital climate uh, variability. And there were multiple legs that were planned with, uh, with those objectives. And many of you here in the room have worked uh, in those legs uh, uh, very hard. So this, uh, this orbital uh, forcing, as uh, course uh, came into, into um, be drilled, uh, they, they was uh, known that uh, this orbital forcing was very pervasive. And that means that it was orbital forcing, for example, here, these are the sections by uh, Heiko Palki at all uh, from the Equatorial Pacific, and those are uh, the, uh, the Oligocene. And here, uh, the was tie of the uh, carbon, uh, delta 13 carbon, with the uh, paleomag and with the, uh, with the orbital parameters, uh, being that this was Milankovitch forcing into the, uh, the climate uh, uh, variability that we saw in the uh, records. Here is one from the Antarctic. In this case, uh, what it was tied for, for the orbital variability was the uh, uh, barium aluminum ratio with the um, uh, mass accumulation rates of the IRD. And again, we were able to, to tie these sections to this orbital forcing in natural climate variability. For the longer term um, uh, records, uh, there are many, many single holes that were also providing very good information about how the Cenozoic uh, climate had changed uh, through time and also the Cretaceous. Here is the, uh, the graph that also Ula uh, showed um, that's uh, from Zakos et al. 2008. And we do have the, the uh, history of um, Earth's climate for the past uh, 65 or so million years with the greenhouse here, shaded in green, that Ula mentioned with the early Eocene climatic optimum and the Paleocene-Eocene um, uh, uh, transition. And then the cooling that took place after 55 million years ago or so that uh, went to this big shift, instantaneous shift really when we talk about geologic uh, timescales at the Eocene-Oligocene uh, boundary that it was when the uh, first uh, continental size uh, ice sheets formed in Antarctica. The climate um, after that, um, as you can see here in the ice house, the isotopic oxygen isotopic record is then a mixture of uh, ocean temperature and uh, ice volume. So that's something that needs to be detangled. And, um, but it was very variable until we did get after the mid Miocene climatic optimum and another big uh, cooling uh, that uh, takes us to, to more recent times. 
So this, uh, this data, uh, the, here is the CO2 data. Uh, now there is compilations that are much more out, updated, and we will see one later on. But here we see how they, at that time was seen that the greenhouse world, the warm house when, with no ice at the poles, was corresponding with high CO2 concentrations, while the ice house world was, con was coinciding more with lower concentrations of the CO2 in the atmosphere. Very important data that was coming into play through all these expeditions was the better understanding of how the latitudinal uh, gradients uh, change on the Earth. Here is the, the North Pole and here's the South Pole. Here's the temperatures and these two are for the Eocene temperatures, uh, pretty flat when you look at it, although afterwards we had uh, more constraints uh, from drilling in Antarctica and we will see that. But very interestingly is this uh, modern uh, is the green line, is the modern temperatures that are pretty co similar to the uh, Pliocene temperatures, the early Pliocene temperatures. However, in the poles, the Pliocene temperatures were warmer than it is today. And this is a, a, a concern when we look at the future trends of climate change because uh, there is the polar amplification that uh, needs to be um, put in the plate and they're very, very important for uh, the climate models. I won't go much in detail uh, with those because uh, also some of the things that uh, were discovered were these extreme uh, events that uh, happened to in the greenhouse. Those, uh, Ulla did mention those in much detail, but basically they're very warm, very rapid. The warming uh, in, the, in the Paleocene, Eocene uh, thermal maximum took place 1,000 years and lasted uh, 150,000 150, years to 200,000 years and it goes together with uh, ocean acidification and an increase in temperatures. So these are very uh, key um, events to study as a rapid warming events like the one that we're experiencing today. The, uh, finally, the other thing that was very, um, very this, this, uh, this actually the extreme uh, climate events and the abrupt, uh, rapid climate uh, shifts during the ice house were the topics uh, that the IODP, the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program Science Plans, focused on. That was the main focus for this, for this part of the ocean drilling. And um, again, these are abrupt changes in the climate system. They were observed in the Greenland ice core uh, during the last glacial maximum, there, there were these uh, spikes of warming that were taking place very fast, up to 25 they discovered. And these are correlated in the ocean drilling records with uh, major ice rafted debris that um, are known as the Heinrich events. And uh, well, the first um, time that these were observed were in DSDP 94, then was 162, and through time this has been extended through, through time, not just to the uh, last glacial maximum, but also extended back to the mid-Pliocene uh, transition. So these were very important because indicated uh, that, well, there was an, uh, uh, an ice volume threshold in the uh, mechanism for this rapid climate change. Interestingly, the uh, drilling in Santa Barbara Basin um, did also observe very rapid climate change taking place. Uh, there were, um, there were um, uh, between 50 and 70 years, and uh, several of those uh, were able to be correlated with these, uh, these uh, events that were seen in the uh, Greenland, ice, um, Greenland ice cores. So this was... Uh, indicating that this was global, was not just a, a one ocean, a regional uh, response, and it uh, indicated a strong coupling between the, uh, the atmosphere, the northern hemisphere ice sheets, and the uh, hydrosphere. So we, 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 through this time, we were getting this knowledge of how the climate had varied through time, uh, how uh, it was orbit orbitally um, forced, for the, for the most part, but, the still, the, but, the, but still we were getting these rapid extreme climate events that could not be explained through orbital variability as well. And that the events were of global, um, of global um, character. 
So now we're here to this, uh, this uh, new science plan. This is the one that is in the current phase, and this has focused not in, we have gone from the orbitality to the extreme climates, the rapid climate change, and this uh, is very focused to address key questions that are very relevant uh, for society these days. And here is the four challenges that relate to the climate and the ocean change, uh, reading the past uh, to understand the, the, the future. And the challenge one is uh, how does Earth climate uh, system respond to elevated uh, levels of atmospheric CO2? The challenge two is how do ice sheets and sea level respond to a warming in climate? What controls the regional patterns of precipitations, those associated with El Nino or the monsoons? And how resilient the ocean to chemical perturbation is? So these are the four challenges. Uh, in the rest of the, the presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on these two above because those are the ones that I have worked um, more. Uh, but I want to mention that uh, for challenge three, all the regional drilling that has been going on during this uh, uh, first phase of the program uh, in the Indian Ocean is going to be key to be uh, answering some of these, uh, these um, uh, questions. So here is again the uh, Xenozoic uh, climate evolution uh, from 45 million years now to, to present, about uh, zero uh, here. We have the ocean temperature variations. And on top panel, we have the most complete uh, record of the atmospheric CO2 variations. So we also have here in this right part of the panel we have the future project, projections of the IPCC uh, on the report of 2013. And uh, here is uh, the, the 2100. This is the end of our century. And uh, if we project back, we see that um, this is the range of changing temperatures that uh, were given by the IPCC, considering this is the most pessimistic, most pessimistic scenario. That's the uh, uh, 8.5, and the blue is if we, that's the, that's the most optimistic, that's the, if we were to, to be able to mitigate. But the temperature range goes from 2 degrees uh, to 4 degrees. The CO2, sorry, goes from 400 to above 750. And when we look at our record of the Earth's um, uh, climate record, we see that both temperatures and CO2 um, uh, concentrations have not been uh, experienced by our planet for a long, long time. Ula showed very nicely how the ice core record that extends its beautiful record of climate with all the greenhouse gases concentration and how they relate with temperature. This record does not, um, um, does, does not, has not experienced in the past eight, 800,000 years concentrations that are similar to the ones that we have today in our planet, which is 408. CO2 um, parts per million. So anyway, so what we are uh, concerned is in looking at how the geological record uh, on the oceans can tell us how the ice sheets have responded uh, in time, uh, in past times where these uh, concentrations of CO2 and elevated temperatures uh, were taking place. <clears throat> so what I'm going to show you is an example of the, the um, peak conditions, greenhouse, this is uh, the Eocene. These are times where the ice sheets did not exist in both poles. This uh, was beyond the threshold for the modern glaciation as we know it. And then we will go into looking at an example of the Pliocene, which is the, the closest uh, analog. Just to mention that um, the Antarctic ice sheet again forms here, the, the first continental size Antarctic ice sheet forms here around 34 million years ago. Uh, um, and then first in DSDP, this was related to the opening of the gateways um, that isolating Antarctica thermically from uh, the oceanic uh, circulation. Um, lately, it was uh, more uh, linked to the decrease in CO2. We're going to see how they may be both playing at, at here. Then we know from the Arctic expedition that sea ice uh, did exist in the Arctic in, um, in, uh, the, uh, in the Eocene, but uh, the uh, Greenland and the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets did form uh, after around 2.7 million years ago. 
So here is the 50 years of uh, polar drilling uh, that has taken place uh, here in Antarctica. It seems that we have done a lot. Uh, we think we have done barely anything, but uh, there is from DSDP uh, here in the Ross Sea and uh, the Wilsonland area in Lake 28 uh, and Lake 29. There were several ODP legs uh, in Pritz Bay in the Antarctic Peninsula and in the Weddell Ocean. Uh, we uh, also have the uh, Integrated Ocean Drilling Program expedition in the, in the Wilkesland area, just at the mouth of uh, 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 the Wilkes Subglacial Basin, and just the one that uh, just ended, the Ross Sea that um, uh, ended uh, this uh, past February. In addition, this map also shows some other uh, drilling attempts uh, and, and programs, and that's uh, more specifically, specifically all of those related with the Dry Valleys project, the Cape Roberts project, the Andrill. Those are uh, continental drilling and also drilling from the sea ice into the seafloor. So those are uh, more continental drilling. Then there has been uh, national programs such as the Shell Drill in the Antarctic Peninsula, that is a US program, and the Amundsen <coughs> Sea uh, drilling of the continental shelf uh, uh, with the MIBO system that uh, took place um, in 2016-2017. So overall, this is the, the picture of drilling around the Antarctic. The Arctic is, um, is, is we know nothing about the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic, uh, we have the ASEX. This was drilled by the, this was the first mission-specific platform that um, uh, uh, drilling leg and, and uh, target this area that was totally unknown. And when you go to totally unknown areas, you're bound to always find uh, great, great surprises. There are other legs that I did not mark here, but they are not really uh, considered Arctic leg. They are just um, uh, below the Arctic circle. Uh, it is true the, uh, the Greenland Arctic gateways uh, in leg 51 and, and, and 163, they're very related to the opening of the Fram and how uh, it relates to the findings that are here by the ASIC expedition. So there are not many expeditions. Uh, definitely not in the Arctic, not so many in the Antarctic. Just notice, we'll go back here, that there is many areas that we have not even touched, and the Antarctica is a huge continent. And um, every time that uh, an expedition has gone, we have found findings that are pretty relevant. I'm just going to mention very briefly the Arctic coring and the ASICs uh, during Expedition 302. And then here the the surprise is that there was this condensed uh, section just uh, at the uh, uh, Eocene Oligocene transition, but they recover a beautiful uh, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. This will show that the Arctic uh, Ocean was uh, extremely warm, about 24 uh, degrees centigrade. Uh, it was completely ice free. Um, going up in the section in the mid Eocene, there were pulses of fresh waters as they were marked by the presence of the Azola. And uh, then, um, well, that was a cooling here that coincides with the Antarctic cooling and, and, the, and the East Antarctic sea ice expansion. And then afterwards, uh, there is uh, the data from the ice house that there, they shows already that the Fram Strait uh, was already connected, uh, uh, the Arctic was connected to the North Atlantic through the Fram, Fram Strait. So hopefully, in the future, there is a mission-specific platform that, uh, that, is, uh, that is targeting to go back to this area. So that's uh, hopefully um, in the horizon for, for this program. Going to Antarctica, now we are here in the Expedition 318. And here also, we were able to recover in one of the site sediments that extended back to the early Eocene climatic optimum. And, uh, here is the pollen that was uh, recovering those sediments. And uh, here is, uh, we had pl uh, palm, palm trees, and these palm trees, uh, they have a pre, they like warm climates, but they can also adjust to, to cold, cool climates. Uh, but the, the main thing is that we had pollen in the sediments that they were uh, related to the family of the baobabs that are today. This was indicating that the, the temperatures in Antarctica during the early Eocene climatic optimum were very warm, and that they really the, uh, the, the, the associations of pollen were indicative of the existence of uh, paratropical forest in Antarctica at that time. 
um, as we go into the, um, uh, in addition, sorry, there were organic um, uh, biomarkers that were studied that were also pointing to very warm uh, uh, temperatures. So they were both pieces of, inf of, um, of um, information that were giving these, these uh, temperatures. As we go into the middle Eocene, we see that we lose the paratropical forest and in, in, instead we increase the pollen that is uh, more characteristic of the uh, temperate uh, forest, uh, like uh, with the Araucaria aracana and also with the Notophagus forest instead of what we had before. So we do see this very warm early Eocene. We do see this cooling into the uh, middle Eocene and uh, Peter Weil et al, um, looking also at comparing with the, with the records around the Tasman Gateway that were obtained during leg uh, 189, uh, well, they did, um, they did uh, look at the dinocyst and what were endemics and what not, and then they, they did put forward this uh, model that they, at one point uh, during the early Eocene, the cool, uh, Rusty gyre was uh, prevented from entering this area. The gateway was closed at this point. The Lewis current that is very warm was bathing the uh, coastline of the Wilsland. And then in the earliest, uh, in, the, in the middle Eocene, there was an opening that allowed this, um, this current to bathe uh, the coast, uh, uh, cooling the site. Very relevant, uh, I think, is that, that uh, you know, there were, the, 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 there were these uh, paleotopographic maps that uh, were created. Antarctica right now, if we take all the ice sheet and we compensate for the classiostatic adjustment, what we have is, uh, these are the continental areas. The West Antarctic ice sheet is mostly uh, based on sea level. Eh? It's below sea level, grounded. And then in the East Antarctica, there is these big basins where there is also the ice sheet is grounded below sea level. Uh, but when we reconstruct how the paleotopography was at the Eocene Oligocene boundary, we see that this uh, entrance of water that we have now in the East Antarctica, also in the Weddell and in the West Antarctica, did not exist. Five? Okay. I have to run. So what that means is for the, uh, for the ice, uh, there was a big mismatch between the, the sea level record of 60 uh, meters above uh, present for the Eocene Oligocene that could never be matched with the models with this paleobathymetry. But once we added this uh, uh, land in Antarctica, that allowed for the, for, the, for the matching of the sea level record with, uh, with um, the uh, ice sheet. Pliocene. Pliocene, there were two major uh, expeditions. One, this uh, uh, Andril program and the 318. We have to think that until the IODP, there was a still a debate about the, uh, if the ice sheet had been stable or dynamic during the Pliocene. And uh, well, this is again the time where we have, uh, for the first time, concentrations of CO2 that are closer to what we uh, have today, and also the continents are in the more or less the same positions as now, so the climate system is more similar to what we have. The Andril program found a series of uh, sediments that uh, were pointing to uh, times where the, the ice sheet was not in the site, times that were similar, and times where the uh, ice sheet had advanced. These were also um, uh, modeled uh, by uh, Polar and the Conto, and the model reproduced very nice the record that uh, the uh, Andrew uh, section was coming up. In the times where we had the uh, open waters, uh, there was prediction of this collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet with seven meters uh, sea level equivalent. With the, uh, um, this is the compilation by Miller et al. about the uh, sea level of the Pliocene. There's, there's many error bars here, but uh, there is a consensus that uh, was around 20, 20 me 22 meters, plus or minus 10, of uh, sea level change, global sea level change. And uh, the uh, ice sheet uh, of the West Antarctic ice sheet was providing for the seven meters, the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet that would have to be melted by then with have the other seven meters, so the equation was missing some of the uh, some of the water. So it had to come from parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet, and that's where the uh, data that was collected during the the ODP expedition 
um, did uh, provide using neodymium isotopes on the uh, fine uh, fraction, the heterogeneous fraction, it would provide provenance of the uh, Ferrar group that uh, is uh, th thought to be underneath the ice sheet in this area. So the ice sheet had to be retreated hundreds uh, of meters into the subglacial basin. This is the data that I'm not going to go in detail, but actually what is important is that some of the data can be correlated with one other site on the continental, sh site, continental shelf that does show the grounding line retreat uh, landward uh, at some of these episodes. So this is the model that uh, was done with the Andril, uh, and uh, it could never reproduce the loss of the ice. And then by adding uh, some, some other processes like the, uh, the atmosphere um, and hydrofracturing in the ice shelves and also the, um, the cliff um, collapse in the, in the other areas of the margin, it could reproduce the sea level uh, loss, 15 meters of sea level loss. So we may be able at this point to close the, the sea level um, uh, budget for the Pliocene. Well, this was actually to, num to, to just mention that the sea level we know from uh, work like uh, the one that done by the Tahiti expedition that sea level is not a linear retreat, but that sometimes goes into very uh, definite steps. And this is what it was found in the Tahiti course by the Shams et al. And this is just looking a little bit at the future. Uh, because we, we have the expeditions, there's, there's many uh, that are going to this is the one that just came back. This one is scheduled for next year. This uh, is also scheduled for next year. There's also other expeditions in the uh, Southern Pacific. This is an area, as we saw in the maps, and we will see in one map afterwards, that has been very little data. So it's, it's great to see this. This would also allow for the uh, strategy that the IODP has of drilling these latitudinal transects. We need to make connections between the ice sheet, the ocean, and the far field record, if we had to understand. This, I just wanted to mention that all these proposals that have gone in the, the, the system have gone through a coordinated effort that has been done within the SCAR phase. Uh, SCAR is the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, uh, Past Antarctic Ice Sheet Dynamic Program. Um, these are other um, expeditions that, you know, I think the, the results from these expeditions will be able to link to these these upcoming expeditions. This is the, the relevance of why the East Antarctic ice sheet is also important. Before we thought that the West Antarctic ice sheet was the one that was uh, pretty uh, vulnerable, but now in a new paper that just came up, the East Antarctic ice sheet margins are showing as vulnerable as the West Antarctic ice sheet. So the final thoughts that I will leave you here is uh, that, uh, well, the improvements in technology have always meant advances, and I think we will continue to need those. That the regional plan, joint resolution, will provide good synthesis, like the one that will happen in Antarctica, but this will be uh, better if those are coordinated. The latitudinal transits um, with similar scientific objectives need to happen, and I think this happens because these positions are being scheduled with different scientific objectives and there will be links, but uh, it would be nice to see one that has a coordinated scientific objective. The legacy samples, uh, every time one goes to a, an area, we look at the legacy samples back and we always produce uh, new records from these legacy samples. And this I'm going to let you read, I think. I'm done. Yes. So unfortunately, we run out of time for questions. So if you have questions, please come to the town hall tonight and talk to Carlota. Just a final comment on this. As you, will, you have seen, there will be a sustained activity around uh, the two poles for the next years with three expeditions around the Antarctic, two with the Juidis resolution, one with the mission-specific platform, and there will be still one mission expedition platform around uh, the, the Arctic before the end of the program. And I now uh, ask uh, Juliana to come on stage to uh, chair the last part of this session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to chair the last part of our union symposium. 
And it is time for me to present the next two speakers, which are the two male scientists we have in our session, so gender balance, we did pretty well with that. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Miki Strasser. Miki Strasser is full professor in sedimentary geology at the University of Innsbruck. His research contributes to the better understanding of the geological processes that governs the nature and evolution of earthquake, subaquatic landslides, and tsunami. His research results help toward a more accurate assessment of risks from uh, uh, such uh, natural hazard to people and infrastructures that we know which are crucial in our society. He has been involved in uh, IODP, International Ocean Discovery Program, as a sailing scientist, and he is lead proponent of a proposal to core sediments in the Nankine Trath. He has received uh, numerous prestigious awards, including the AGU, American Geophysical Union, JPGU, Japan Geoscience Union, Asahiko Taira Prize uh, last year, so he has received the prize uh, in New Orleans. And, uh, and then he has received also the International Association of Sedimentologists Young Scientist Award in 2014. I haven't finished yet. And he has also received the Hans Kloss Prize in 2011 and the ETH Medal in 2008. And with this, I would like to welcome Miki to give uh, his uh, presentation. Please be on time and uh, yeah. The stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, it always feels that it wouldn't be me, and I'm going to conclude on in, 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 in like 30 minutes from now that it's actually not me, but it's always a team <laughs> effort um, that succeeds in these kind of achievements. So what, what I'm going to do um, today is to talk a little bit about slipping and sliding. Um, uh, Lisa McNeil already touched a lot on the slipping theme, which, which in my talk now kind of relates to earthquake slip. And being a sedimentologist, looking at like from a, from a sedimentary perspective, trying to reconstruct things like earthquakes and tectonics, I will need to understand the sliding things, how mass is being transported, how mass are sliding in order to make inferences. So I'm going to jump back and forth, slipping and sliding a bit, um, in order to capture the Earth in motion by scientific ocean drilling. And it was a great pleasure to kind of um, got invited. Thank you very much to, 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 to have this talk here. And it gives, gave me an opportunity to go back in time a bit and kind of start to see where's the legacy coming from, where this kind of earthquake, um, in particular the subduction zone, was, was, was first mentioned. And it was kind of interesting, if you think about subduction zone, earthquakes, you would think about the Pacific Rim of fire, but actually the word subduction um, pops up for the first time in, in Lake um, 13, which is the Mediterranean. So, so the Mediterranean was chosen to actually be the place to test the subduction model, uh, which, which, re which, which results from plate tectonics. So, so as Judy mentioned, people went out to study um, spreading, ocean spreading. So if you have ocean spreading in a plate tectonic theory, somewhere needs to be compression, right? So it was Ken Xu and others, um, including Austrian scientists actually, that sailed that. So it's kind of interesting to see the legacy of Swiss and Austrian scientists going out to take the first sites, drill the first sites in the Hellenic Trench to test and, and, and then followed by, by Lake 18, um, Roland von Hühne and others to test basically this, this trench sedimentation and see whether indeed they can prove compression of, of these sediments that are here kind of still drawn in kind of a geosyncline type of, um, so you can see there's no plate really subducting yet, so they didn't dare yet to really draw it. And, and what they found, and this nicely has been worked up later, in particular by the Japanese scientists, among other uh, Tyra sensei, um, when, when also, when also um, it, it improved imaging of these systems, um, that indeed these deep sea trenches, um, which form among the deepest part of our oceans, up to 11 kilometers deep, they are mainly composed of, of turbidites, mass transported, sediments that have been remobilized, deposited in the trench, and then being sheared off, forming this accretionary prism. And it is mainly this theme in kind of having, having the conversion plate uh, motions which eventually kind of trigger earthquake down here. It was well imaged by, by geophysics 
um, that earthquakes are occurring, and then having all this mass, this dirt that kind of is deposited in the trench. And conceptually, and I will show you quite long, conceptually, this has just been, you know, it's gravity. Of course, all that dirt ends up in that trenches, and then is being deformed. And, and ocean drilling, in particular deep, uh, like DSDP and later ODP, they, they tested all this kind of understanding of accretionary prism formation, of fault deformation and all this, in, in a series of, 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 um, of places, and as shown by Lisa McNeil, usually they, they, they went to the shallow part of the compressional system because that's where, where the drilling capacities um, were, were possible. And this is where I got my first exposure in 2002 when I was lucky enough to sail as a student trainee in like 205, um, as a student trainee. And, 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 and we drill through these wedges here that kind of get compressed. And I, as a sedimentologist, was particularly fascinated about shallow water carbonate bubbles deposited here in something like four kilometer water depth. So this is kind of indicative of having huge amount of mass uh, remobilization. And again, all the tectonics and, and geophysicists and geomechanic people, they say, oh yeah, of course, it's gravity. You know, it just comes down and, and it's being deformed. So the focus was mainly on the subduction zone. But I got fascinated by, by these shallow, uh, by, by, by these mass transport deposits, uh, which must have been occurring in these trenches. And then the time went on, and while writing, um, like in, that about, that's about the time when I entered scientific career and, and kind of went to finish my master thesis, when, when the IODP, the first Integrated Ocean Drilling Program science plane came up, with, with that major objective of understanding seismogenic, se 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 seismogenic zone experiments, which Lisa McNeil nicely introduced. Um, but but um, if, 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 if we now kind of make a jump and kind of say, okay, what, what did we learn by now? And I'm not going to reiterate that we did learn a lot about seismogenic zone experiments and we are still learning a lot. And of course, it, during that time, like um, from, from around 2002, um, there were two main incidences, um, which were the two major earthquake, magnitude nine uh, Japan trench and, and Sumatra, which kind of changed a lot um, our understanding. Lisa McNeil showed that slip to the trench, shallow, shallow slip propagation, tsunomogenesis or so. And if we look at an instrumental record, we, ba we basically only have four giant earthquakes that, that we recorded, that we kind of say, okay, we measured those, they, they are happening. Um, but obviously, we don't, we don't really know whether there is a difference between these kind of regularly occurring magnitude 8 earthquake that you get once per year somewhere on this planet versus, versus these, these more bigger ones. So basically what we really lack is, um, is a, 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 a record um, that goes um, more back in time to understand or, or just like to, to see whether this, this slip to the trench, mega thrust, bigger mega thrusters are different than what, what, what the geophysicists usually measure. Um, so, so the challenge, um, to, or, or, or one option to do that, obviously, is, 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 is IODP, which, which is the tool that kind of provides us a window back in the past by studying um, the, um, the geological record. But the challenge, of course, is how do we actually recognize an earthquake in the geological record? And, and this goes back now to, to one of the grounding, uh, grounding fathers of, of, of IODP. So, so like he was, he was the first, the first uh, co-chief to, to sail on DSDP leg one, um, already um, published like, like far before the first, the first um, drilling vessel went out uh, about that 1929 Grand Bank earthquake where we learned actually that, that big earthquakes um, can trigger um, big um, debris flows and, 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 and turbidites, and we know that from having telegraph cable uh, broken along the way. So, so, it, it's, so, so, so the process is kind, of, is, is kind of there, and maybe that's what my colleagues being on the ship were referring to when, when I saw a turbidite or a cobble or got excited and said, hey, of course, it's, it's gravity, you know, the tr trigger, earthquake trigger. So that's, that's what they shake down in the trench. Um, the most, so, so that's, that's among the first occurrence. The most recent occurrences, which is quite exciting, just came out last week um, in science advances, was the, the Kaikoura earthquake, which, which also had reported um, from, from 
differential multiple symmetry and a lot of nice uh, coring taking along the canyon, that actually earthquake triggered widespread landslides in the canyon head, um, causing canyon flushing and turbidite currents. So by now we have a very good understanding that landslides um, do occur. And what I also want to, to, to highlight is, is what Lisa McNeil already highlighted, that with ocean drilling and, and learning how to, to sample the past and, and, and to study all this, obviously site surveying data um, revolutionized. Huh? And, and this, is, this is something which really goes along. By now, we actually can produce images like this using multi-beam bathymetry, where we have here, for example, the Hikurangi margin, and, and here the lower slope, trench slope of the Chile trench, where we see things like margin-wide um, collapses, like the ruratorial landslide in New Zealand, and the reloca slide um, here. And just look at the scales. These are like something like 500 meter big blocks and, and, con and, and collapsing the entire margin. So using things like multi-beam bathymetry and reflection seismic now, 50 years later than, than when our um, first, first pioneers went out to drill trench sediments, we actually can, can get a much better understanding. And we know by now that um, um, submarine slides um, resulting from, from mass movements and gravity flows are key agents in sediment transfer and, and also organic carbon to the deep sea. I'm going to touch that in the very last few slides I have that they may, but certainly not exclusively, relate to earthquake. Um, so, so there are examples where, where mass movement happen that do not relate to earthquakes and, and that can produce tsunami waves and also can damage um, expensive and critically important seafloor installation. Um, when, when we kind of sum up, um, and, and I'm, I'm now at the stage, so around something like, like five or six years ago, when the new, or actually, almost 10 years ago, when the new science plan of the current phase was formulated, that it was the INVEST meeting in 2009 in Bremen, where, when I, as a young postdoc, had first time to not just participate as a scientist, but also was involved in like formulating the questions, we could kind of summarize that the submarine landslide questions um, kind of the, are the, the, the challenges can be and very broadly, roughly, summarized in these big three questions. It's why do certain trench slopes or, or just certain submarine slopes fail whereas others remain stable? Why some, uh, that's kind of the same, or wh why some slides remain small while all, wh while all grow big? So we have small and, and, and some can go really big. And when and how often do they occur? And what is interesting to me, and now I'm going to, to these themes from, from earthquake slipping to landslide sliding, um, these are the three fundamental questions to understand earthquakes. You could basically reply, replace landslides with earthquakes. You can say, why, why do certain, well, not the first one, I'm sorry, but of course the same, well, so why do small, uh, some earthquakes remain small where others propagate and, 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 and become big? And of course, when and how often do they occur? Um, so it was, it was in the phase when the current science plan was formulated and this new theme, Earth in Motion, was added as, as, the, as the fourth major theme to look at processes and hazards of, of human timescales. And, and, and one of these challenges was, was, was added um, to address earthquake landslides and tsunamis. And, and what, what really, where, where IODP is really making the transformative um, um, or delivers the data to make the transformative advances is to sample and that the in situ conditions to understand the dynamics. And again, you kind of can replace that for earthquake slip and landslide slides. It's kind of the same um, to access samples, um, to reconstruct magnitude and frequencies, and then kind of study all the preconditioning factors that might be around things like, like uh, in situ stress or, or sedimentation rate or sea level changes or tectonics that, that kind of make preconditioning versus some transient stresses or transient instabilities um, like an earthquake or a fluid flow or tide that may eventually be the, the final trigger. So this is a big, big, big challenge to really understand the entire system. So now I'm kind of summarizing what has been done so far, and, and for that theme, 
Um, I'm afraid I only can present four expeditions, so not like the other themes that have like hundred, not hundreds, but, but several tens of, of expedition studying submarine landslides. Um, within IODP is, is really young, young uh, just in the, in the current phase. But there have been at least four um, successful completions of um, um, at landslide targets. One is the Gulf of Mexico, and, and here, and which I refer here to like a passive margin environment. Here they test the differential um, sedimentation rate that is inducing some kind of um, subsurface fluid flow and hydrogeology on the stability of the margin to produce these big landslides, which you can see here in this transparent uh, facies. Um, so so they, they, are, they learned a lot about this preconditioning factor of pore pressure. Um, interestingly, um, some papers published by Stigal and, and Dugan actually propose maybe even for passive margin an earthquake trigger is needed to actually destabilize these big slides here. Another expedition here successfully completed the mission to understand um, big mass movements um, collab for, from, from collapsing volcanic island uh, landslides. Um, there has been a, an earlier drilling once by, by JR um, um, in, uh, on, on the Hawaii, the big, the big uh, collapses of, of flanks of volcano. So, so there, is, there is knowledge to be gained here. And this one is the most recent one um, um, in, in Hikurangi. Was, I think it was completed in January this year, where they targeted a, a landslide um, body here, which kind of interacts with the bottom simulating reflector here. So there are ga evidence for gas hydrate. Um, and, and based on, on geophysical studies and, and, and um, like conceptual modeling and hypothesis, um, uh, formulating they, the, the, the chief scientists or, or the, the, the people here involved hypothesized that maybe this mass is actually creeping related to gas hydrate um, destabilization or maybe pressure pulses from below. So the cores were just taken here. So there is exciting signs to be expected coming out of this expedition to understand the relation between gas hydrate and submarine landslide. And I'm going to introduce you a, a bit more detail and a bit more data on that Nankai Trough um, uh, landslide study, which where I was being involved in. And um, I'm not going to reiterate this. This is just it gives you the context. So Lisa McNeil talked about the Nankai Trough seismogenic zone experiment studying this subduction margin here. Um, basically, what uh, this is just uh, the 3D seismic cube again looked from a different view. And what, what, what we are now going to do in the next five minutes or so is to look at the interplay between um, submarine slides and the subduction zone processes where we look at this area here where we see a lot of landslides cars here um, on one of these the thrusts coming out and we were able to drill two sites um, to actually address these, these basic questions which I formulated a couple of minutes ago. Um, so we successfully were able to drill two holes with, with complete locking and wild drilling uh, suites and, and here is basically the summarized data set of one of the holes so we have something like a 300 meter um, record here that spans something like 1.4 million year um, with, with, with a lot of occurrences of these landslides so yeah, we could study them and infer um, magnitude frequency relations and, and, and dynamics. And the, the, the major findings here is that actually something like 50% of the entire sediment in these subduction zone um, um, so basins is, is, is made off of mass transport deposits. And, and another interesting thing, which I show you some more data on this, is actually that the recurrence interval of emplacement of such big landslides is, has nothing to do with the earthquake uh, cycle. So we, we are off by something like three order of magnitude. Um, and then there are some more specific uh, landslide related um, achievements here. I would like just very briefly show you a major uh, thing in, in, in achievement and this relates to technology. I think IODP has, has over the time made major advances in introducing new technologies which actually help the science to, to go to the next level of understanding. And one thing is was that, that the Japanese uh, sail a computer tomographer um, on, on, uh, on board 
GQ so we can get 3D images of the, of the borehole. And this is just as a comparison, this is how a sedimentologist would look like in visual core description. It's a greenish gray silty clay, right? Um, here, if you do radiograph, maybe you see some density contrast, but if you're able to rotate and see a 3D, you start to see deformation structures, kind of opens a new way of looking at the, at the um, um, together with Juliana Parnieri, actually, I think these are figures from you. Um, <laughs> we looked at what, what, are these, what are these strikes here, so we could see that these are pyrotized um, warm tubes of bioturbation, which get deformed in shear zones. Um, so so we, get, we, we get new proxies for strain. And I think this is a fantastic um, um, example of how, how new technologies allow us to look at the cores in different ways. I guess by now, I've, I've visited the talks yesterday and the day before yesterday, so I guess m most of the physical sedimentology people in marine environment these days take a, a 3D um, CT images, but IODP was among the first to introduce that. So let's look at this, at this um, um, uh, recurrence interval. Katrina Kramer, a postdoc with me in, in DDH Zurich, she looked at in more detail on the, on the dating, because if we want to talk about frequencies, we need high resolution um, H model. So what we did is uh, isotope stratigraphy, which is, we, we've seen many, uh, which is kind of exceptional for going in like deformed sediments and try to do an isotope stratigraphy, but we were able to distinguish between what is undeformed and what is deformed. We also did on the youngest one, we did radiocarbon dating and found that actually this, this first um, mass transport deposit here was emplaced exactly, so th I think this is the Bendix stack um, f um, curve here going from the last glacial to the, to the current Holocene, and, and we see that the emplacement was in that transition zone. And if we, if we zoom in and use um, all the tephra, so, so all tephra identification that related to tephra chronology in Japan to get tie points, and, and kind of try to like remove our mass transport deposit and try to uh, match to the to the uh, global stack of the Bendic foraminifera, and then down here basically plot the emplacement of the landslide um, within kind of a, a paleoceanographic um, context. We learn that the ages of the slide events coincide with with um, yeah, the interglacial periods or sometimes as shown for where we really have high resolution dating actually in the transition zone from that. So, 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 so we kind of propose um, some kind of climate forcing on submarine landslide in a subduction zone environment that has earthquakes every 150 years. Um, so this is an interesting concept which then relates to what I said before, preconditioning, uh, like how stable are the slopes, again together with Juliana Panieri and, and, and her postdoc and looking at gas hydrate, we, 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 we formulated some hypothesis whether the gas hydrate stability could change if the Pacific deep water is changing by a couple of degrees. I'm not going in detail here, I just want to show the interdisciplinarity of, 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 of like these different themes and it's not always just linear if you have a hypothesis, but actually, and that's the great thing in IODP, you learn to integrate between different disciplines. Okay, so these are the key findings, but okay, we are still left with the challenge, right? We haven't really, we haven't really resolved it yet. So, so the challenge in order to address the challenge number 12 in the science plan to understand frequency and occurrence of, of earthquake eventually remains how are earthquakes recorded in geological record and how can we re reliable determine um, earthquake recurrence interval? And for this, um, that there, there has a group, a group of people um, in, in several workshops came together and looked at all the, the margins and, and what is available from shallow piston cores, conventional coring, and we basically identified something like four areas like Cascadia, Ikerangi, the Japan Trench, and also the Mediterranean, where we're testing this, this paleoseismology hypothesis on whether we find records. I'm just going to show you um, what we learned from the Japan Trench and then end um, with, 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 with some highlights from, from pre-site survey data of an IODP proposal, which we hope will happen in the future. Um, I'm not going to reiterate here the, the Tohoku earthquake. I think we are well aware of that this is the first event of its kind worldwide, um, that, um, which had the entire activity recorded. 
and where slipping and sliding processes have been caught in action. And, and the slipping process has already been shown by, by uh, Lisa McNeil. So we have this fantastic JFAST drilling, uh, something like a couple of, maybe a year after the earthquake slip that caught the temperature frictional heating out here and, and really kind of was, was the first really to, to, to prove that paradigm shape of, of slip to the trench in shallow earthquake. One minute left? Good. <laughs> so so, so um, there are these proposals now um, to study this in more detail, the JTRAC proposal to go a long strike to really try this, this new idea that, that also was supported and, and kind of ground truth by RDP to really understand what are the governing mechanical um, um, constraints here, but again kind of coming back to what would be the recurrence rate of this slip to the trench earthquakes. And as we learned from the Tohoku earthquake, um, there, there is a huge suspension cloud which hangs around something like 44 um, months still after the earthquake has been video observed. And most fascinatingly, in the deep sea trench here, we find this, this uh, homogeneous mud layers. It's, really, it's not turbid, it's really mud. And if we look at the LED, um, the radio short lived radionuclide, we see that actually the entire mud is very, very, very young. So what it seems actually that these sediments, they are not resulting from big landslides. So there is another process that plays where earthquake shaking is just remobilized, just peeling off, steering the, the, the surficial sediment and, and remobilizing this into the trench. And we learn from taking several cores and going back in time using tephra stratigraphy of known um, ashes from the um, from the um, Japanese history, um, we can actually tie these mud turbidites or, or mud, homogeneous mud, um, which we think are these, these remobilized uh, layers and nicely correlate this to historic earthquake. And here's the latest study which, which an ETH student published in Nature Communication this year. Um, where we take one of this, this core, where we have the three historic earthquake, Tohoku earthquake, the, and the, pre, the, the two historic ones, and this is a radiocarbon um, date here, and we see that actually the, the events just have a little bit older sediment, not quite, uh, but just, just remobilizing, um, and again, that just the offset cannot be much, it is just the, the upper few centimeters of sediment that is remobilized. And most strikingly, we see, if we look at the TOC content here, we see that this earthquake triggered uh, event layers have like two order of magnitude higher organic carbon content. And so we propose here a new, a new um, process that, that brings in organic, fresh organic matter into the trench, which links to Fumio Inagaki talking about um, a lot of life in deep sea environment, among others in, in, in trenches. So, this might, might link um, to this. So um, basically what, 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 what the Japan Trench is, so this is just what we have, what we know from conventional coring. If we go deeper with now super high resolution um, imaging, which obviously improved a lot over the last 50 years, um, we see there are a lot of interesting targets which potentially can recover a, a nice history. And, and help us to understand sediment and carbon flux. And kind of 50 years after having drilled the first deep sea trenches, um, it is now a very exciting time to, we, we have new theories and we have in particular new technologies to unravel the earth in motion with unprecedented resolution, resolving the dynamic processes such as those leading and resulting from earthquake slipping and submarine sliding. And with this, I would leave you. I would like to say happy 50th anniversary to the International <laughs> Ocean Drilling. And as I mentioned before, I was influenced by all these people. It is great to have been like being on the ship with these smart and bright people and being influenced and kind of just, I'm just representing this crowd and probably many more here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Miki. Maybe we have a time for yeah, a very quick question. Please. Very quick question. So it was a wonderful talk. Yeah. And I, I would like to extend it to the question. How did the earth affect salt tectonic zones in the festival? At least I have a gulf of Mexico you were showing, I have a standard place in the south of the where everything is also creeping and moving. How do earth 
I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with, with the Gulf of Mexico. I just know the literature. But, but there, are, there, are, there are earthquakes that, that may reach magnitude 5 to, to maybe 6 or so, which may produce enough ground shaking um, to, to induce um, transient stresses on the unlitified sediments. And in, in particular, if the pore pressure inside these bodies um, are already kind of elevated and close to critical failure. These, these tr additional transient pre um, uh, stresses induced by a magnitude 5 or 6 earthquake may destabilize the slope. This is a hypothesis that has been proposed by, by Brandon Dugan and his, his students. Thank you very much. I think that we have to move on, and, uh, but Miki will be with us this evening at the town hall, so if you will have more questions, he will be happy to answer. And then uh, now I'm going to present you the last speaker of our very interesting union symposia. The last speaker will be Fumio Inagaki. He is a geomicrobiologist at the Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology, JAMSTEC who has explored the deep subsea floor biosphere through scientific ocean drilling. Over the past 15 years, since ODP lag 201 of Peru in 2002, Fumio has participated in a total of 10 scientific drilling expeditions, including IODP Expedition 329, South Pacific Gyre on Joides Resolution, 337 Shimokita Coalbet biosphere and 370 temperature limit of the deep biosphere of Muroto on the Chikyu as a co-chief scientist. Given his contribution to scientific ocean drilling and uh, scientific achievement, he received the first Asaiko Taira Prize by EGU JPJU in 2015. And uh, now I would like to welcome on stage uh, Fumio. So first of all, I'd like to say thanks organizers for inviting me and a very generous introduction to me. And uh, the, it's a great session, the 50 years anniversary of the scientific ocean drawing, which is really, really great. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be here. And uh, more than 50, 15 years or, or maybe more, uh, the many microbiologists and biogeochemists um, participated in the scientific ocean drilling expedition all over the world. And uh, so the latest estimate of the global South Sea floor biomass is currently 2.9 times 10 to the 29th, uh, corresponding to a 4 gigaton of biomass carbon on Earth. And uh, this 10 to the 29th is huge number, actually, at least a 4 to 5 order magnitude uh, higher than this uh, number of stars in the universe. And like universe, uh, there are many, many mysteries still all remain to be solved in the deep biosphere research. For example, as Judy has already mentioned, what is the nature and extent of the deep south sea for a biosphere? This is a great question, I think. And uh, when I go deep, uh, I think it's probably better to introduce a first look of the deep south sea for a biosphere, which was uh, going back to the 1955, the Scrip, Scripps uh, professors Richard Morita and Zobel published a very good uh, uh, paper in Limnology and Oceanography, and, and they organized uh, uh, the piston calling cruise from uh, San Diego to offshore Hawaii, and uh, they, they did a very careful cultivation-based uh, microbiological studies uh, using an eight meters piston course. And they described all available evidence points to a slow continuous activity of the bacteria in eight meters sediment and concluded that, that we have reached the lower limits of the biosphere. After 40 years later, uh, since uh, the uh, Monitor and Zobel publications, uh, when I was a uh, graduate student, I was very much shocked by this paper, the British literature's 
Professor John Parks and their queens. Uh, they show that the uh, remarkable number of microbial cells are present in sediment down to 800 meters uh, below the seafloor, which is two order of magnitude deeper than the uh, Morita and Zobel conclusions. And importantly, uh, this microbial, these microbial biomers uh, are logarithmically decreasing with depth, and we haven't yet seen the bottom of the biosphere. We don't know how deep microbial communities are going on. And then, uh, what are the biogeochemical rules of microbial activity in deep marine sediment? And what types of deep microbial life are living in there? Uh, to address such a, uh, important questions, uh, so Steve Dont at URI and Bob Jorgensen at Max Planck Institute in Bremen organize uh, uh, ODP Lang 201. It's a ODP Lang 201, which was the uh, first uh, microbiology deep biosphere dedicated uh, dedicated scientific ocean ruling. And I was very much lucky enough because I could participate as a microbiologist on board Joyce's resolution and uh, sail together. Uh, and uh, the, we got, we got uh, many, many uh, microbiological core, sample, core samples uh, from Eastern Equatorial Pacific and Peru margin, where TOC is very much different, and uh, made uh, uh, this exhibition uh, resulted in uh, the many, many fascinating discoveries. Uh, shortly speaking, uh, we confirmed the presence of mi microbial cells in sediment from sea, uh, near sea floor down to the basement. And also, uh, we observed that the, the, um, those microbes, sedimentary microbes, are slowly breathing uh, to get some energy for uh, sustaining their life over geologic time uh, by uh, this anaerobic respiration of pore water geochemistry. Therefore, some, even it, it takes a long time, microbial activity play some rules in biogeochemical elemental cycles. And uh, the, my motivation for the ODP Lang 201 was to know the, uh, uh, the, what kind of microbes living there. And uh, I extracted DNA from core sediment and uh, sequenced a part of genomes and studied the microbial community structures. And uh, shortly speaking, it seems the microbial community structures are well stratified and somewhat different at site, especially at different sedimentary conditions. For example, the presence of methane hydrate or not, or organic content difference. Uh, this is the, the very uh, early stage of the biogeographical distribution you know, and diversity of the deep subsea floor biosphere. And uh, importantly, the, what we detected from subsurface, the marine sediments are uh, very distinct, evolutionally distinct uh, from any known uh, microbes, living, living microbes uh, on the surface world, terrestrial biosphere or even our human gut uh, biosphere. The deep subsea floor lives are very different. Therefore, uh, these members are physiologically unknown. Yes. Then, the question is, uh, how does the marine deep biosphere interplay with other Earth uh, systems? So today, uh, we know that the, the photosynthetic primary production in the ocean is uh, controlled by sea current and uh, the orbital uh, primary systems. But what about the deep biosphere? So in 2000. In 2020s, uh, Jens Kalamiers and his colleagues uh, published a very nice paper in PNAS uh, describing that the, the distribution of uh, subsea floor biomers greatly buried between continental margin and open ocean sites and is tightly associated with the productivity and organic burial rate of the overlying ocean. Uh, this means the subsurface and the surface biosphere, biospheres are connecting with each other. And in 2014, the Bremen team published uh, uh, the result of new medical uh, network modeling, a uh, neural network uh, modeling for the microbial sulfur reductions. And they uh, calculated that up to 
29% of the buried organic matter are oxidized with microbial sulfate reduction in the deep sedimentary systems. So also, the IODPX patient 329, uh, as this house plastic shot around here, uh, so we obtain a firm evidence uh, for uh, the aerobic, for the occurrence of aerobic deep biosphere in the open oceans. And we concluded that the, the oxygen may be present throughout the sedimentary sequencing up to 37% of the global oceans. So moreover, uh, we confirmed the presence of microbes everywhere uh, from, from just seafloor down to the sediment basalt interfaces. So even at the very low energy environment, ultra oligotrophic South Pacific Shire, everywhere microbes. Uh, so that's the, this indicates there is no limits to microbial life in the open ocean sedimentary em environment. This is very important discovery, I think. And our ongoing effort for South Pacific Shire sediments in Malav is showing some evidence for the living uh, microbes, aerobic communities, even in a 100 million year old aerobic sediment in the South Pacific Chile. So, so these results show that the, I think, uh, the deep subsea floor biosphere interact with uh, surface biosphere. It's probably okay, and may play important ecological roles in the global element cycling. But uh, it, it will still remain, and what, what are the key environmental factors that limit the deep biosphere on the ocean margins, which is much deeper than the open oceans? And uh, to address these important questions, uh, the, uh, Kai Wehindich at the University of Bremen and I organized IODP Expedition 37 in 2002, 2012. Uh, that was the uh, first riser drilling microbiology excavation targeting on the deeply buried coal bed in the ocean. And uh, using the laser drilling technology of the Chikus, uh, we could extend the world depth record of scientific ocean drilling down to roughly 2.5 kilometers below the seafloor and obtained over 2,000 deep biosphere samples by laser drilling technology, which is great. And uh, as uh, Mickey has already shown, that we can use uh, XCT scan. This is fascinating technology because we can visualize uh, uh, visualize and uh, check the, um, the very detailed lithological feature. For example, this figure shows the, the, the coal bed cores. Uh, you see the occurrence of some deformed mass stone and the occurrence of pyrites. And before splitting the half and half, so we can identify which is the best part for microbiological sampling. This is great. And uh, so from this expedition, so there are many discoveries. Uh, for example, uh, okay, okay. So w one of the interesting features is the microbial cell abundance. The so cell abundance is going here and sharply dropped at around 1.5 kilometer below the sea floor, where the temperature is 40 to 50 degrees C, which is, I think, important. And also, the, even at the 2.5 kilometer deep, uh, we could see some tiny low biomass microbial communities and uh, some other geochemical data, for example, the deuterium or carbon isotopic composition of methane and a clamped isotope of methane and a bicarbonate uh, carbon isotope and the C1C2 ratio, these geochemical data consistently suggest that the occurrence of microbial ecosystem working on in situ, in situ, which is very important. Uh, then, uh, using a nanoscale, a secondary ion mass spectrometry, so-called nanosims, uh, we also have some firm evidence that most of sub floor microbes, over 70% of the sedimentary microbes at least, are indeed alive, and they are revivable. Or when we add some nutrient, they start incorporating some substrate and then activate it somehow, which is great. And then using this nanosims technique, uh, we also uh, gather some farm evidence, nice, nice evidence uh, showing the very slow life in two kilometer coal bed. And this is a collaboration uh, study of Caltech and Jamstec. And uh, so we had uh, some uh, evidence uh, showing 
the, uh, the deep uh, coal bed microbes are consuming the methyl compound like uh, methylamine or methanol and incorporate such a methyl compound into their body. And uh, when we calculate the turnover rate, doubling rate of these uh, deep microbes based on a deuterium and a carbon uh, nitrogen uh, stable isotopic compositions, uh, so we reach a conclusion that the, uh, the doubling time uh, ranged from several months to over 100 years, uh, at least, uh, because this is uh, in vitro uh, conditions. So, given, the, given those uh, very interesting findings, uh, Bo Berko uh, comment, commented that the deep sub C4 microbial cells are physiologically standby. And, they, uh, and he pointed out that the, the on Earth, uh, there is a two, uh, two biospheres. One is high energy surface world where we are living here, uh, the high energy world, and a low energy subsurface world. And also Boy pointed out that the intact bacterial cells and their genome may survive for a million of years in deep marine sediment. It's fascinating. And the question is, are they cultivable? It means, can we wait for them? Uh, because it's very critical if we ask, okay, the, please cultivate and, and uh, the, the post, maybe student or postdoc says, oh, I can't because I cannot wait. But don't worry, so w we can use uh, some nice technique, a downhanging sponge and flow through bioreactor systems. Uh, when we use this system and add some anaerobic seawater uh, to Corbett, uh, we can activate somehow even two kilometer Corbett communities and after several months, we get uh, many, many cells growing uh, like a zombie, you know, starting <laughs> growing. It was amazing, really, you know, the many fresh cells start growing, uh, including the uh, CO2 uh, reducing hydrogen trophic methanogens. I think such cultivation, innovation, uh, maybe uh, open a new window uh, to the new era of microbiology in deep biosphere research. Culturing is brilliant. And they are waiting for us over geologic time. And the, by the way, the, what about the, what, why, why the cell biomass is sharply dropped at 1.5 kilometer below the sea floor? And this figure shows uh, the compilation of uh, cell abundance, uh, cell abundance uh, published so far and uh, it, it's clearly uh, showing that the, the, the distribution of sub for biomass is controlled by buried organic matter and depth functions. And uh, the, we see the sharp drop of microbial biomass in a Corbett biosphere at 1.5 kilometers, uh, which is roughly 40 to 50 degrees C. Then uh, now we think one of the constraining factor to limit at the, at the bottom of the deep biosphere is temperature. So, because it's, uh, if, the te if we go deep, uh, temperature will increase, and then uh, the microbes has to fix their biomolecule damage by taking up some energy supplied by water or something. And then, but, uh, the, but for example, this uh, color plot represents the lysimization of amino acid is sharply increased increase uh, at around 40 to 50 degrees C, like a boiling egg, egg, boiling egg uh, you know. Then uh, the, if there is no supply of nutrient energy in this environment, the microbes below biomass may be sharply dropped. This is a balance issue, but, uh, but uh, this is one of the possibility. Then what is the temperature limit of the deep subsea floor biosphere? Uh, to address this, uh, another question, uh, so we organize the temperature limits of the deep biosphere of uh, Muroto, the so IDP expression 370, uh, so-called T-limit project. So this is Kochi and uh, Cape Muroto, and we drilled here, so, so IDP 370 size C23. And uh, this area is, um, has been drilled so far, so uh, much for ODP expansions and uh, so well known that the, uh, it has a little bit high heat flow, the heat flux uh, area. And uh, I'd like to show a three minute video and then, uh, you know, the, the wrap up the, the, my talk. Only 
a few decades ago, marine scientists made a surprising discovery. Life in the ocean extends deep into the subsea floor in the form of microbes. At first, scientists doubted their abundance deep in the sediment where energy and nutrients are scarce. Thanks to nearly 50 years of scientific ocean drilling, we now know that they might exist here as much as in the water column. But how deep can they thrive? And what are the conditions in the deep biosphere that ultimately limit microbial life? On September the 13th, 2016, IODP Expedition 370 set sail to drill a special site of high heat flow in the Nankai Trough. Special because here, beneath 4.8 kilometers of water, the geothermal gradient is steep enough for scientists to access a temperature horizon so high that it could prove fatal to ocean organisms. These cores will help scientists determine the depth limit of life, as well as the overall influence of temperature on microbial communities. Hyperthermophiles can survive in temperatures nearing 120 degrees Celsius. These microorganisms thrive in the energy-rich conditions of hydrothermal vents. Down in the subsea floor, however, the energy required to support cell repair is in short supply. In the hopes of tapping the bottom of the biosphere, the IODP scientists drilled down to this currently observed temperature limit of 120 degrees Celsius, 1,200 meters into the sea floor. Since IODP's last visit to this area, analytical methods have greatly improved. This work requires advanced lab spaces equipped with cutting-edge technology, which can be found at the Kochi Core Center, just a helicopter flight away. Here, shore-based scientists receive fresh core samples for in-depth microbiological investigations and conduct time-sensitive analysis using cutting-edge technologies. The microbial story can be found in the sediment, but to better characterize the thermal regime of the subsea floor at these critical depths, the scientists installed a temperature sensor string down the borehole, allowing them to continuously monitor temperature in real time. After two months out at sea, 112 cores, 13,000 samples for analysis, and temperature monitoring in full swing, the chick successfully completed its mission. Now, these scientists are well on their way to finding the limits of life deep in the ocean. Yes, uh, the, as shown in this video, so this expedition targeting on the limits of life and the biosphere. And the two studies, the limits, the very low biomass of microbial communities, QAQC, the quality assurance and quality controls, is very, very important. And uh, in order to set up these conditions, experimental conditions, uh, the, uh, we, we uh, set up the Geomicrobiology Super Clean Room at Coach Core Center. So all whole walls, uh, clean facilities, and uh, we can uh, establish a very clean environment, walk-in laboratory uh, clean environment here. So you see the particle counters, 0 0.3 micron is always zero. And uh, so this figure shows the, the very, very tiny microbes are sitting on the microscopic side. And uh, maybe you see here the lonely, lonely microbes. and. Uh, uh, during, during these expeditions, we achieved the minimum detection limit, uh, four cells per cubic centimeter of sediment, and a minimum quantification limit, uh, which has a two order magnitude statistic confidence, was 16 cells per cubic centimeter of sediment, which is at least four to five order magnitude 
lower than the ODP Land 201 in 2002. And uh, now, the, the next, uh, next month, uh, we will organize the second post schools meeting, and uh, the now currently, the, the many international researchers are working on this uh, tear limit samples, including high pressure temperature incubation to detect microbial activity at the edge of uh, biosphere. And also, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, I organized um, the JAMSTEC post -ex drilling expedition uh, using uh, ROV Kaide and uh, Kaiko and successfully retrieved the temperature data from Decomet. Uh, 800 meters uh, decomet for 1.5 years record in situ. And also uh, get some shallow piston cores. And this is a very good news and progress. Then uh, for the wrap up, uh, what are the next uh, questions for life and earth primary system? Uh, in, in my perspective, it's probably uh, interesting or important to address how did or will the deep biosphere co-evolve with the planet Earth, such as plate tectonics, intimately intertwined with the mantle convection. And also, how the Earth's future habitability will respond to the planetary scale environmental changes? Such great questions can only be achieved through, in my opinion, the scientific ocean drilling. So we need to drill. So the last three, I'd like to acknowledge the many, many international friends and co-workers and colleagues uh, in the multiple um, doing expedition, including ODP Lang 201, IODP Expedition 329, and uh, 337 for Shimokita, and the 370 T limit, and the Jamstack coach staff. They're always very much helpful. And of course, funding agency and Jamstack. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fumio. I think we have uh, time for a question. Well, Fumio will be with us this evening. So um, on behalf of the other conveners, we would like to thank all the speakers for sharing with us uh, these uh, fantastic data and uh, the very interesting experience that they have had. They, they ha they have had through their uh, expedition, and uh, they have provided the base for the future of ocean drilling. And uh, again, I would like to remind you to join tonight at the town hall. We will meet from 7 to 8 in the room K2. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>